So since it's two UTC on the dot and actually 301 now in uh, Amsterdam, I think we'll uh, uh, we'll just get started with uh, 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 with the introduction and the kickoff of the analyzing IET uh, I, uh, on the IAB analyzing IETF data workshop. Show me the numbers. It's great to have you all here. In a different world, I would be welcome you all now to the slightly cold but clear and sunny Amsterdam, and we would have a hackathon in the building of the University of Amsterdam. And we would probably have a nice dinner on a canal boat to see Amsterdam from its prettiest sites, from the old canals. We would pass by the central station to the Eye Lake, to the harbor and past the newer parts of town. Uh, unfortunately, we currently do not live in that world. And as you might have seen on the news, the Netherlands is one of the countries with the highest prevalence of the COVID-19 Omicron variant right now. And before that, the COVID numbers here were already rising at an alarming rate. So in that sense, it's probably good you are not here in person, at least for now. But this then also offers me the possibility to already invite you for an in-person follow-up to this workshop where we can exchange, discuss, and hack together in person. Having that out of the way, I'd like to welcome you all to this workshop on behalf of the IAB, the program committee, the co-chairs, Colin Person and Corinne Kath, the University of Amsterdam, the Insight IT project at that university, and the Netherlands Organization for Scientific Research. I took this picture a few weeks ago at the place where Amsterdam is working on new roads and pavements down city center where we would be meeting. So what this uncovered is that to replace and repair visible infrastructures, there's a lot of invisible underlying infrastructure that needs to be taken into account. And that these invisible infra digital infrastructures expand ever more and get more important at the same time. The social geographer Keller Easterling writes that infrastructure sets the invisible rules that govern the spaces of our everyday lives and that changes to the globalizing world are being written not in the language of law and diplomacy, but rather in the language of infrastructure. And standards, I'd add to that, are the grammar to the language of infrastructure. So standard setting has become one of the main norm setting processes for information societies. <clears throat> Standards in the past have facilitated safety, trade and communication going back to early human civilizations. <clears throat> However, modern standardization is traced back to the middle to the late 19th century to standardize steam boilers to ensure their safety, screw threats for interoperability and steel rails for performance. Technical standards can be viewed as a public good because one, because one firm can use a standard without diminishing another firm's use of the standard. Standardization also structures markets, facilitates competition, and lowers prices for customers. <coughs> Pardon me. Trends in standardization have moved from government standards to more private standards bodies. That, in combination with technological development, have contributed to the speeding up of standardization processes, which has formed the basis for a lot of innovation on top of these standards. Whereas there seems to be a convergence on industry-led private standardization practices, not all private standardization efforts function in the same way. There are a lot of different processes and procedures, intellectual property policies and access policies for the output documents and participation. Whereas most standardization now revolves around consensus building, there is no consensus of what consensus actually means and how it is achieved. All these different ways industry-led private standardization bodies function affects the standardization process, the outputs and also its outcomes. That means that how SDOs work impact societies in ways we do not fully comprehend. Increasing this comprehension is what we would like to research with you, especially in relation to the Internet Engineering Task Force. To put it more succinctly, what can Internet Engineering Task Force data tell us about the impact of procedures, its culture, and who participates and who is not? And how also how this changed or how it could change? When I talked to Jay Daly, the executive director of the IETF administration LLC, he said, when I entered the IETF, I was surprised by the lack of the use of data. It's like people prefer to argue rather than use the data. 
So the work we are doing here potentially can inform the workings of the IETF, its participants, its leadership, as well as the people that are relying on RFCs and the people that are impacted by them. And these are not just aspirational goals. In the IETF Administrative Strategic Plan from 2020, there are three points of, uh, uh, that mention the use of data. As people who work with data, we all know that data is not just a mere objective representation of reality, but it really depends on what data is available, how it is acquired, and how it is represented. This is why we are very excited to have such a rich combination of participants in this workshop, hailing from different parts of the world, from you know, researchers, from social sciences, beta sciences and the humanities, as well as IETF staff and leadership, IETF participants and implementers. The questions ahead of us now are how IETF data can be used to improve the IETF and its processes, create better standards that see more implementation, aid IETF leadership, authors and community members, increase IETF legitimacy in a time where standards increasingly gain geopolitical attention and scrutiny. And to aid this work, how can we create a diverse and sustained community around people that use IETF? IETF data and maybe even produce IETF data. We hope that this workshop can be a start of this, where we combine discussion and exchange of insights and concrete working on problems in the hackathon and presentations and discussions on Thursday on what we have achieved and how we can take this work further and what other issues are uh, to be identified. So you have all seen the agenda and the schedule and just here to repeat it. Today, we have a, a, a list of talks where we get more insights in what there is and what there are and what there is not done. Uh, Tuesday and Wednesday, there will be a hackathon. And Thursday, we look at some issues that weren't discussed today and uh, look at the results from the hackathon. Because we have people from diverse backgrounds and experience present that are used to different forms of debating and working together, we would really like to emphasize that we'd like to create an environment in which everyone can and will actively participate. This is a space and a community that we build together, and it would be great that we all take that into account in the discussions. After one and a half year of online meetings, you probably all know the video conferencing etiquette, but just to repeat for completeness, when not speaking, please uh, mute your microphone. If you want to speak, please raise your hand in WebEx, or if that doesn't work, just visibly. Please be mindful of background noise. Try to keep your camera on if possible to increase interaction during the workshop. Uh, uh, try to avoid multitasking, and also feel free to use, to, to use the chat for discussion. This workshop will be recorded and published online as is customary with IAB workshops. After the workshops, member of the program committee will write a workshop report with the help of today's voluntary note taker, Kate Pundike. Thanks so much for that, Kate. And also special thanks to Cindy Morgan for uh, handling many of the logistics to uh, get us all together. <clears throat> with the danger of repeating myself, the sessions today will help us to understand what data there is, what tools there are to analyze the data, understand what work has been done on this data, and with these tools, and what methods and data are missing to answer relevant questions. This should form the basis of a research agenda for the IETF data and to inform the hackathon as well as future research and development. If by the end of the day, you don't have a group or project for the hackathon in the coming days, please do let us know and we will seek to assist to uh, link you together. <clears throat> but of course, feel free to use the communication tools available as there are uh, uh, WebEx, of course, there's the link for uh, uh, today and for Thursday, the WebEx for uh, uh, tomorrow and Wednesday, the Slack channel of which uh, Miria, I think, has posted a new uh, link if that hasn't worked, uh, Gather Town for especially for uh, Tuesday and Wednesday for the different groups to meet together. There's the website with the papers and there's GitHub where you will be able to find uh, the presentations. If you haven't been able to upload your presentations to GitHub, feel free to email them directly to me and I will upload them to GitHub so everyone can uh, scroll uh, through them. So if there are no further questions, 
we are a bit ahead of time and we can start with the uh, first session, which will be chaired by Yari. Yeah, hello everybody. Excited to see what we are going to uncover this week on this, this topic. Um, so why don't we get started? Let me see if I can share. We're used to WebEx sharing. Hmm. Okay. So I'm not sure if I'm able to do this. Uh, crap. Uh, Would you like me to, uh, uh, if uh... Yeah, if you could, there should be a PDF file with uh, set under the session one and then all. So while you're trying to figure out how you share, um, maybe one more comment. So because it's also nice to see all the faces right now uh, on my screen. So um, welcome, everybody. Nice to see you. And um, as I said already, or as we said already in our email, we hope that this will this workshop will be very interactive, a lot of discussions. Um, so we have a session now where we have a little bit more presentations talking about tooling and what data is available, but then the later sessions today, we have only very short presentations and hopefully a lot of discussions. So everybody feel free to engage and, and uh, let's make this very interactive. Do you see the shared screen or not? Not yet, at least not on my screen. We saw some sharing, but it was black. What about this? Yeah, yeah, now, now we're there. Okay, um, so the first lesson is about tools and data and maybe a little bit also about methods. Um, so we have 45 minutes. It's not a huge amount of time. There's actually quite a lot of information that we could dig into. Um, the program committee chose uh, four topics to be sort of explicitly um, discussed or, or sort of uh, presented briefly. Um, but there's more in terms of the papers. So go go read um, the materials that is pointed to here and also maybe to some extent in the other papers in the workshop. So we have um, uh, Robert, uh, Sebastian, Stephen, and Greg talking about their topics. There's maybe 10 minutes or so uh, for each of these things. So let's try to keep it, keep it brief. I think this session is maybe a little bit more about uh information than discussion but we should also enable some some uh, time for for discussion i did want to say one thing on this first slide uh, and that is that uh at least my mental model for for thinking about these things is that this this data the actual data that, that is you know exists somewhere or can be obtained and then there's ways to access it typically you cannot access data directly you have, have to have some tooling for that and then it, that, that is actually separate from actually using it for some purpose to, to calculate some graph or do some analysis. And the analysis itself is, is separate from uh, the, the reason for doing this or, or some action that perhaps the IETF could take or some company could take when they see that, ah, well, we are focusing on this and other companies are focusing on something else or you know, whatever the, the observations are. Um, so it's kind of important to remember that there is this uh user there somewhere that has a burning need to do something whether it's a itf participant or the itf as an, as an organization but they ha may have some needs and getting getting uh sort of uh pull from those parties for what, what we need to do is important the other thing that's that's kind of interesting that we often seem to be somewhere between the formally recorded things and and things that could perhaps be recorded or could be determined somehow that we're sort of living on the bleeding edge that, well, we didn't record this information, but we could perhaps uh, determine it somehow. So think about those two things uh, while, while we're going through the, the rest of the discussion. But I'll leave it there. Uh, maybe Robert, you could um, start uh, talking and uh, Niels, if we can advance to the next slide. Niels, go ahead and go to the next slide, please. So I'm going to talk very briefly about what is available in the data tracker and in the data sets that the data tracker maintains. 
Um, these things fall into three large categories. These are files that are available on disk that can be retrieved over HTTPS or through rsync. There is metadata about many things that the IETF does being tracked in the data tracker and stored in its database, stored in SQL, structured as a set of uh, uh, Django models that you can use the Django or ORM to access it and archives of the mailing lists, which are maintained separately by an, uh, another Django project called the Mail Archive, um, but the data tracker and the Mail Archive interact um, to provide access to them. I've started a longer set of notes that will be, I hope, useful for people over the um, course of the sprints at the link here, aid the IBA data resources that has detailed um, information about these three categories and how you can get to them. So during the, the next few minutes, I'm just going to hit a few highlights. If we could go to the next slide, please. So the best way to get access to the data tracker data, to get all of it and to do anything that, that you want to with it is to set up the local data tracker development environment. Um, the easiest way to do that is using Docker. We've recently reworked the way the data tracker Docker environment is built. Um, Lars put a lot of effort in and Nick put um, some polishing touches on it to uh, um, give you an, an environment within 40 minutes or so because the initial build is quite large um, to be able to um, access the data. There is a developer database that's created nightly. It has all of the data, very, very few things are scrubbed. Um, there's a footnote on the page I linked to earlier that details the scrubbing, but it basically boils down to people's personal passwords are scrubbed away. Um, there are, again, instructions on how to start up with the local development environment at that link. If you don't want to download the database or you have um, programs that you want to build running in runtime um, against the production database, there is an API built on TastyPy. It's a, a REST-based um, API. There are instructions at the link above at the notes page on, on how to use it. I'll give a couple of examples. You can just access this with HTTPS. It's best accessed with curl piping the output into JQ, and I'll give a couple of examples in a moment. You can't do quite as many things with the API as you can do if you have the database available to you directly. Um, there are certain um, restrictions on the interface that the API provides um, to protect the production server against performance issues and things of that nature. When you are using the API, one thing that we've discovered you need to be very careful with is if you are retrieving large data sets, you want to order your data set. The TastyPy um, infrastructure underneath uh, does not provide its own, and, and, the, and the objects that um, are being exposed don't provide their own natural ordering. So if results are paginated and you haven't provided your own ordering, you will get um, chaotic results. Go ahead and to the next slide, please. So a couple of brief previews of what you can do. Um, working in Django's shell on top of the database, you can query the documents that I've created use, just using my name by working through against the models. That number seemed quite large to me, so I went in to see what my document types actually were and discovered that the data tracker thinks I've um, contributed 67 drafts and 191 reviews. Um, the language is um, fairly easy to pick up, and again, there are pointers for it in, in that note. Let's go ahead and go move to the next slide. With the API, you can feed a query into curl and tell it to format its output as JSON and then manipulate that with command line JSON manipulation tools to do things like very quickly and easily find out which drafts are in last call. At least these were the sets of drafts in last call when I prepared this slide last week. We can move to the next slide. Thank you. So what is in there? The data tracker is huge. The, the database is uh, that the reason that that build takes nearly 40 minutes is, is mostly in loading the database. It, it has 
the numbers that you see on the slide, large numbers of documents, people, meetings, information about the interrelationships between these things. What's not in there is interesting. We have, as a design goal, kept minimal personal identifying information for people. We'd have their names, we have what's needed for them, for us to interact with them as documents go through the um, development and publication process. Um, but we have very carefully not gathered a lot of information about people that um, might otherwise be interesting. There is a start of the structure, a start of a description of the structure of what's in the database at the second link, which is also pointed to by the first note. Um, there's a lot of, of entity relationship diagrams um, to provide a quick introduction to what the models are and how they're interrelated. And as we go through, particularly the sprints, I'll be around to help um, um, answer questions about the, the, the more intricate parts of those relationships. Let's go ahead and move to the next slide. We try to capture what has happened um, whenever a document or a person record or um, any of the other uh, things that we could be interested in history are changed. We capture an, a record that shows what the state of that thing was at the time that it was changed. Um, this has provided us very good history from the point that we put these mechanics in place. But the backfill of history before we put these mechanics in place, which was roughly a decade ago, um, is um, in, inconsistently complete. And there is a, there are many places where it is not complete and a few when you get into particularly old period of times where it is just flat out wrong. And there we occasionally have projects to go fix wrong data or to fill in missing data. Um, they're driven by need. Um, we're not putting the effort in just to have a, a nice polished curated um, data set um, back to the beginning of time. The models are themselves are designed for tracking the current state of work. That can mean that there is impedance when you approach it trying to talk about what happened in the past. Um, the tools are designed to be efficient for talking about now. Um, there's an example on the slide right now uh, because of the way we capture who is a working group chair. It can be very difficult to find when someone quit being a working group chair. You have to infer that from the data instead of the data saying it's saying it explicitly. And the, the query that you have to put together to do that inference is complex. Um, next slide. Yeah, the, the, I think that's it and I'll pass the cue. Thank you, Robert, and uh, thank you also for those two two links that you had. Um, I actually had a quick question on those. Did, did you, did you is the, the is the same material available on a more long term basis? These are like notes for the, the this this session or this, so this workshop. Tend them to be a seed for a uh, set of artifacts that would be available on a on a longer term basis. That would be very useful. Thank you. Do people have comments or questions for Robert? Don't see any. So maybe we just move forward then and talk about uh, Big Bang. Sebastian. Hi, um, I've got a question, which is how do I advance slides on this? Do I wave at Niels? Okay, um, slide. Um, so th this talk is a, a couple parts. First, I want to talk briefly about Big Bang, which is a scientific software toolkit for analyzing um, open online collaboration and deliberation, and then about a particular research project that um, uh, is sort of a goal of mine for the workshop. So um, Big Bang is a, a Python toolkit. Uh, it really grows out of the scientific Python community. Um, it allows uh, ingest from a number of different data sources, including uh, open mailing lists, Git repositories. It's been linked up to the IETF data tracker. 
uh, listserv, which is a mailing list host used by 3GPP. Um, and it, uh, it provides a lot of different sort of inference uh, tools and analysis tools that might not be available in basically the structured data itself. So things like entity resolution for names and organization, uh, scripts for various forms of social network analysis, uh, natural language processing, uh, message content time series analysis. Basically, though, it, it, it helps uh, bring the power of the scientific Python stack to this data, which has been made available through these various open standard setting sources. Uh, we're hoping to integrate uh, information extraction soon. Um, originally, it was uh, designed to, to look across various different open, uh, open sort of collaborative communities. Uh, this is an early plot from the first paper on this showing the interaction between the scientific Python community, the Wiki, Wikimedia community, and the OpenStreetMap community and showing that there's some bridge nodes between those groups. Slide, please. Um, it began in 2015 uh, and is swiftly adapted to study human rights advocacy in IETF and ICANN. And since then, it's gotten investment from Article 19 to do improvements related to gender and affiliation detection and integration of the IETF data tracker. Um, and most recently, it's been awarded funding from Germany's prototype fund, which we're hoping to take it to a proper 1.0 version. Uh, a number of different institutions have been affiliated with it uh, or contributed to it in the past. And presently, um, it's one of the best things about it, in my opinion, is its community. And we really welcome you to get involved. Next slide, please. Um, so an example of what might be done with this sort of analysis, um, uh, a question that's been puzzling me for some time, is this question of uh, the difference between individual and organizational behavior. So uh, in the sort of the ethos of the IETF, there's this view that uh, people that are participating are participating, participating as individuals. But naturally, they're also often acting on behalf of organizations like companies. So. Um, there's normative questions that are associated with this, and I don't have a, I'm not gonna weigh in on the answers to those questions, but it might be said that individuals, individuals might be better stewards of the public interest than a commercial organization. But uh, there's a related descriptive question, which is how to determine when individuals are acting independently versus as part of an organizational action. And what's interesting is that's empirical work that spans different levels of abstraction, which is uh, quite tricky to do. Next slide, please. Um, luckily, uh, for example, the mailing list data from IETF is precisely this data that operates on many levels of abstraction. So not only is it divided between many different working groups, but it's also divided between um, every email address has a domain as well as a prefix. And you can group emails by their domain uh, and then see how domains and or prefixes participate in different working groups. So. Uh, one might ask, just looking at this count of participation in different working groups, does domain X um, have more or less of a stake than domain Y in the first working group? Are they more, are they more coordinated in their actions or not? Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so there's this interesting recent paper by Siegenfeld and Baryam, which uh, talks about using the complexity profile of a phenomenon across different scales or levels of abstraction to determine how much the uh, participants or the, the components of that phenomenon are coordinated. So a random distribution of, uh, of agents is, is gonna be uh, highly weighted in terms of it, the, its counts and its complexity in the lower end of the scale and not show a lot of structure at a higher scale. Whereas uh, as, these components become more organized, the distribution shifts to the right. Uh, next slide, please. So uh, with some preliminary work on the distribution of email addresses within each domain, um, if you look at a generic email address like Gmail, it has a very high standard deviation in the number of messages uh, per specific email prefix and a low median, which suggests a random organization. Uh, people are not coordinating among with other people with gmail.com addresses, whereas um, apple.com addresses or other sort of organizational emails seem to have a higher median 
there's fewer people from Apple just sending just a, a couple of emails and then quitting. You know, they're they're more involved if they're involved at all, and that suggests a more correlated, organized approach. Uh, and then at the other extreme, there's uh, personal email addresses uh, that are sort of highly important people that have their own email domains, and they tend to have a low standard deviation because they're not generating a ton of extra nonsense emails and a high median. And that suggests a very coherent organization that um, that's that's a that's a, a single entity acting. Next slide, please. So um, a next step for this work is to consider organization within working groups and see whether particular working groups are distinguished based on individual participation or sort of domain or organizational participation and the kinds of uh, domain level organization and participation that are observable. So uh, just as an example for HTTPSA, um, Gmail has this very, very um, highly skewed uh, sort of uh, random-esque distribution. There's, um, whereas the Google.com who were very involved in that, uh, in that working group, um, there's a lot of area under that curve, which uh, indicates perhaps a corporate or organizational strategy. Um, that is all my material. Thank you very much. Yeah, uh, thank you. Any uh, quick comments or questions? We do have some time. You can just speak up uh, unless we get a congestion on the queue, which we don't appear to have I, right now. I saw Paul growth hands was raised. Oh, I was just clapping, but uh, <laughs> I, I use the clap emoji. So I did have a question though. So would you be interested in using those data as input to actual like computational models? I mean, this is a little bit far up question. Uh, Not at all. Absolutely. That's that's we're hoping to do. I mean, um, what is a computational model exactly? Uh, I think we already have like some. For yeah. Like for example, calculating the diffusion of uh, information in the network, right? So how does, over time, how, do that, how does messages from Google propagate over the, the network? So we'd love that. I, I've tried that and haven't haven't gotten it to work. So you know, please let's talk and welcome that contribution for sure, one hundred percent. Sebastian, do you perhaps uh, could you elaborate a bit on the documentation and how people could or uh, should use it? Yeah, uh, we've actually got a new documentation website thanks to the prototype fund. I'll put the link into the chat. We're now at bigbang pi dot read the docs dot io. And um, we'll be updating that documentation website over the course of the hackathon, among other things. There's also Sebastian. a GitHub at a, let me get this, yes? Put the link in the GitHub. Yeah, a, uh, thank you for the links. Uh, I also had a quick question on, on this. You mentioned that there's been some uh, work funded by Article 19 on detecting gender and affiliation. Could you? Or do you know what that is about? What what exactly is being done? Yes. Um, so uh, there are some libraries available for basically guessing at gender based on people's first names. There's certainly limitations to that method, um, but it's a quite internationalized database. Um, it's uh, better than you might expect. It has lots of gaps, though, and um, and we've used that to to see, for example. Um, uh, how, which working groups are more or less uh, biased in terms of gender participation. Um, and uh, there's work on affiliations, partly from ingesting from the IETF data tracker, partly by considering this mailing list analysis. Um, there's there's several, uh, I, I guess I should say that Big Bang has a number of Jupyter notebooks in its repository that uh, people that are involved in the community have contributed over time that are sort of samples of analysis that can be done with that data. And um, a good way to understand what the, how, the work, how the software works is to explore that examples directory and see what kinds of analysis have been done before, um, and then get involved in the community and talk to us about it. A number of other uh, presenters at this workshop are um, uh, have used this tool, um, uh, and I don't want to steal their thunder, so I'll let them get into it when they do their talks. Thank you.
Nils, Anyone else? Hands still up. I have a question, but I think Nils is in front of me. So um, I would be very curious to see um, what tools you have um, for identifying what part of a name is a first name. I think that we as a community and, and that there are several communities that have some interesting times in front of them on um, challenging the assumptions that um, a lot of our software currently has about what the structure of a name is. Um, and if you've if you think you've got a particularly good um, handle and start on um, identifying what could be considered a, a name that's identifying an individual in the, the blob of string that you're handed as a name, as opposed to signaling other information, I would very much be interested in um, moving it into other pieces of software like the data tracker. That's a very good point. I don't think we've got any particularly good insight into that problem, but it's certainly a general problem that should be solved. Thanks for bringing it up. One might even argue that if you could separate all names into first names and last names, we're not diverse enough. Yeah, there's some limits to the process when you use these libraries. If I recall correctly, the limit is around 15% uh, failure rate. So we it just means that you can't classify some, somebody accurately, and that's fine. Actually, it could be a good thing, um, but you, you, you still get some, some data as an as aggregate result. We basically um, shell out to a, a, a different um, sort of upstream software component where some researchers have uh, built a tool for doing this. Um, we're not improving on that tool. Um, this might be a case where to improve the uh, to improve the software, it really requires an upstream contribution. Yeah, uh, I wonder if we should actually move forward. So maybe we move to the next slide and then Steven, if you can present your work. Yep, sure, hi everyone. I just want to talk about briefly the ICF data library that we've been developing. So if you go to the next slide. So the library that we've got is concerned with providing access to sort of three different data sources of IETF data. So the, the mail archives, the data tracker, and the RFC index. And if we go to the next slide, we can see that those three different data so sources obviously are provided by three different methods. So for the mail archives, it's via IMAP. For the data tracker, it's via the, the REST API that uh, Robert has discussed earlier. And for the RFC index, obviously it's via an XML file that is published by the RFC editor. If we go to the next slide, we can see what the ITF data library is trying to do. It's basically uh, providing a uniform um, Pythonic interface for accessing these different sources of data. So it will um, communicate with the mail archive over IMAP, the data tracker by the API. It will parse the RFC index XML. And essentially we have a a library that contains a set of Python classes and methods and functions for accessing and representing all of the data that's available from these different data sources. And we provide that, uh, as I say, as a library. Now, one of the other main functions that we've implemented uh, in the library is its ability to make use of a cache. So you can spin up a, a MongoDB instance and our library can talk to that MongoDB instance and use it as a cache for uh, serving requests. So instead of every time you want to access uh, information from the data tracker, instead of making a request to the data tracker directly, that request can be served from the cache. And the library tries to be as smart as it can uh, about uh, managing that cache. So for example, if, if, the, data, if the, the library sees that you're making lots of requests for people from the data tracker, it will eventually tip into deciding to, to fill up the cache with all of the people from the data tracker, um, improving the performance later on. Of course, it's got to balance that sort of performance with trying to be as consistent as possible. So we want to make sure that if your request is being served from the cache, that you're getting the same results as you would get uh, accessing the data tracker directly. So all of that sort of logic is in there, uh, basically to improve performance and to try and uh, reduce the load uh, on the data tracker uh, in particular. 
So thinking then about the, the data that is available, um, for the RFC index, of course, we've got information about authors, uh, the stream. Uh, if it's an ITF RFC, then we have working group and area. We've got the status. Um, we've also interestingly got the, uh, the relationship between this RFC uh, and the RFCs that it perhaps updates or obsolete, or the RFCs that update or obsolete that one. If we go to the next slide, in terms of mail archives uh, via IMAP, we have access to all of the ITF mailing lists uh, and mirrors of different organizations' mailing lists from around 1995. Um, the library exposes an interface that groups those messages by mailing list. And it also provides a thread abstraction so you can see the replies to each message and it provides an interface for, for navigating the, the mailing lists by thread. Uh, and finally, of course, we provide access to the data tracker um, I'll not repeat everything that, that Robert said about uh, what is available via the API, but uh, broadly we've got information about documents and groups, intellectual property, disclosures, uh, things about mailing list subscriptions, meetings, people, and reviews. Those are the main groups of data uh, that we exposed. So just, I want to just finish on a sort of brief example of how to use the, the API and, and, and what's available. So here we can see that, you know, it's, we import the, the data tracker component of the library. We then instantiate a data tracker object. That's the object through which we make our request to the data tracker. On this third line then, I find the data tracker person that corresponds to this email address. Um, so that's my email address there. So it will find my data tracker profile and construct a person object um, if it finds that, that email address in the data tracker. Next, it's going to try and find all of the meeting registrations that correspond, uh, that have been made by that person. So it's finding my profile, and then it's going to find all of the meeting registrations that I've made. And then it's going to print out all of the metadata for any IETF meeting registrations it finds against, that have been made by me. And so if we go to the next slide, we can see the output of this example. And we can see that it's found uh, a whole bunch of meeting registrations that have corresponded to, to my data tracker profile. And if we go to the next slide, uh, just to highlight one of the sort of interesting things about this, this way of fetching the data. Of course, I can enter whichever email address I like when I, when I register for the meeting. And sometimes I enter the wrong one or I enter my uh, university email address. And because we're searching by data tracker profile and because the data tracker knows about all of my email addresses, we can find all of those registrations quite easily. So just sum, sum up then on the next slide, um, the ITF data library that we've been developing provides a Python API for accessing the email archives, the data tracker, and the RFC index. We've got support for caching, um, both to improve performance and to try and reduce load in ITF's infrastructure. The library itself is available via PyPy, uh, so you can just go pip install ITF data um, and you'll get the latest version. Uh, there's lots of examples and the, the source code for the library are all available on GitHub and I'll pop the, the link into the chat. Um, and then the slides, I provided some more examples that you can go through later on and those are all available on GitHub as well. That's me, uh, if anyone has any questions. Thank you. We do have some time for questions, so go ahead. I have a question about um, whether you're taking your model from the data, data tracker, like for person uh, or for registration. So if we uh, grew a field there, would you pick it up automatically or do you need to sort of change your code then? Um, so we have code to detect changes in the data tracker uh, interface. And so we will we'll know if it changes, it will not automatically pick it up. We do need to expand the, the API to include the new field, but we, we do have code that detects it at least. Um, the data tracker API uh, for smaller changes um, exposes a version number and we invalidate the cache if that version number changes so that we're consistent with, uh, with the, the data tracker. And so Mark is asking a question in the chat, if it's possible to populate the cache with everything and then work disconnected. Um, so it's not something that we've implemented at the moment, um, the ability to sort of pull in everything. Um, the, the, the cache tries to fetch from the data tracker, 
um, switch to using the cache um, sort of intelligently. If you're if you're making enough requests, it will switch to using the cache. Um, but it should certainly be possible to do that. Um, it's just not something that we've implemented yet. Uh, thanks, Stephen, for that presentation. That's um, super useful. I've really enjoyed using this library. I, I was curious about the um, the mailing list piece. That that piece seemed new, or or at least I'm not up to date. What what um, what sort of extra interface are you providing as opposed to getting it directly from um, Django that uh, Robert was talking about before, or rather than just parsing it into Parsing the actual email archives themselves. Um, so we're we're not providing a, a a huge sort of abstraction on top of the accessing um, accessing it directly. We're we're just providing essentially a Python API for accessing the messages uh, by mailing list or by thread within those mailing lists. Um, so we're not doing anything um, in the, the way that Big Bang does, for example. We're not adding sort of that that level of uh, analytical code. It's it's purely for accessing them. Um, via IMAP. Okay, great. Thanks. Great stuff. Thank you for doing this. Um, wonder if we could go forward and then do, do some more discussion in the end. Uh, uh, so as, as we're trying to cover different kinds of pieces, uh, so we asked uh, Greg to also talk about uh, the ITF website and what information is actually available there or from, from the use of the ITF website. Greg? Uh, hi, everybody. I'm Greg Wood of the ITF LLC staff. Um, great to see lots of folks online, even though we can't be in Amsterdam today. Um, I have just one slide, which I think if you advance the slide, Yari, talk, uh, I'll talk. Uh, or I guess yeah, uh, Niels is in charge. Yeah, you'll, it'll be a very obvious slide, <laughs> um, but I can start talking. Um, just real quickly, uh, as you already mentioned, um, the analytics we collect on www.itf.org, um, pretty straightforward and um, a little different flavor than what other people have talked about. So um, we implemented this about um, a little over a year ago, maybe maybe 18 months ago. And um, we use a uh, hosted, self-hosted version of Matomo Analytics uh, to collect information about visitors to www.itf.org. Um, the specifics of that implementation um, were uh, defined after consultation with the ITF community, um, and so it's a it's a little more um, focused than uh, a lot of the general web an analytics. Uh, that I'm familiar with. Um, for example, we only um, retain um, individual visit information for five days and aggregate information, uh, I think for 12 months. And we publish summaries of the information that we collect uh, online at the URL that was um, included in PR, one of URI's first uh, slides. So um, is the slide available? I just... Uh, Wanted to know if I should. I don't see it here. Yeah, if you if you could, I don't know if Greg, you can try and share it. It it, it may be that that particular change, which was the last one I did, is not pushed uh, to okay. the GitHub. So yeah, so, sure. Um, no worries. Oh. Ah, there we go. Yeah. Thank you, Niels. Uh, yeah. So um, two other quick points. Um, first of all, uh, that um, the content uh, again, as as I mentioned, is. Uh, or analytics is only only uh, that which is covered in the um, uh, CMS that we use. So um, there is a lot of content on www.itf.org or served under that um, that is not in the CMS. Um, for example, the RFC index and the ID index are uh, both under www.itf.org, but not in the CMS. Uh, so analytics doesn't cover that. Um, but, um, uh, and again, the content is, um, in the CMS is focused largely towards um, two audiences that uh, don't exactly cover ITF participants. Uh, one is potential participants, um, and 
The other is non-participants. So potential participants might be uh, people who are just learning about the ITF and might be interested in getting involved in developing in the work of the ITF and non-participants might be managers of ITF participants or policymakers. Um, uh, so, that, so that's um, something to keep in mind. Uh, and then finally, the last um, bit is that, you know, nonetheless, uh, analytics provides some interesting insights that we didn't have before, which is, um, for example, standards slash RFCs is the second most visited page on the site after um, the home page. And 60% uh, of those visitors seem to be coming from uh, things like Coursera. Uh, and 40% um, uh, of traffic overall uh, to the ITF site come from places like uh, GitHub, which is included in the analytics package um, definition of social networks. Uh, so uh, we, can, we can get some interesting um, <clears throat> views that way and then we can tune uh content uh on the pages to better hopefully better serve the visitors that we get and that is my slide so thanks again thanks craig and uh yeah we have a few minutes for for discussion or comments whether it's uh for greg or or otherwise so please go ahead While we're waiting, uh, let me ask one question from Greg. Uh, do we actually have, is, does this include individual RFCs? I realize that you can get, get them through various means or from your local disk, but might we have data on what RFCs are read most? Uh, no, it, it doesn't because the RFCs are not contained in the, um, in the CMS itself. Um, so it would, it would definitely be interesting to, I think, in general, to understand um, usage patterns in, in for content that is not contained in the CMS, but we don't currently have that. Okay. Unless Robert has some information I don't have. So on no, the I, statistics, oh, sorry, go ahead. I'm saying no, that data is currently not aggregated. On the statistics you have, you release this PDF report. Is there also a different way to um, get the data or would be able to share them with somebody if, if people want to do more analysis? Um, yeah, it certainly would uh, the, uh, be possible. Um, but um, the reason that they're posted in the in the, the monthly reports are posted now in PDF is because that's the way the Matomo makes them most easily available. So um, yeah, the short answer is yes. If, if that was something that we wanted to do, I think it'd be possible to do it. I'm going to stop video, but I'm happy to take questions after as well. Thanks. Be great. I, will, I would also be interested to hear if other people have used tools that we have not discussed here that they think would particularly useful uh, uh, for others to know about or tools that they try to use and then really did not work. You know, one one general observation on of, of this this whole thing is that there's, there's quite a lot of uh, tooling available and quite a lot of data available. Uh, I've been working on this space for a long time, but I, I didn't know about everything before this this workshop. So, so ho hopefully, uh, reading some of these papers and seeing these presentations has made people realize that ah, oh, there's some some data over there that I, I could go get them and use it for for my project. But of course, there's also a question of like what's missing. I just realized that like one very interesting set of information that I don't think 
anybody who submitted a paper to this workshop utilizes, for example, the blue, blue sheet. So you can really see like not only who participated in a meeting, but who participates in which session, how many conflicts we have and so on. So I, I think there is more data around that we could uh, uh, utilize in interesting ways. I think the intersection of all these data sets, you know, offers a pretty great view. Uh, there's lots of interesting data sets by themselves, but when you combine them all, it could be pretty cool. Well, one thing I've been wondering is so, sort of looking outside the ITF a little bit is to see uh, what kind of which kind of pieces of software and, and other items are actually RFC compliant. So what's what's the impact of of the work of the ITF outside the ITF? I don't know if anybody's ever looked into that, but that'd be hugely interesting data for, especially for sort of management research economists and, and many other jobs. So on, on that point, um, the, the ITF is sort of famously saying that we're not a protocol police, right? So this is not something we do as an like organization. However, various individuals have have done it for various pieces of technology. So the TCP guys have, you know, um, kept eyes on on what the different stacks, especially the major stacks, are implementing, and to what degree they're sort of conforming to the RFCs. And I think other uh, sort of areas of technology are doing similar things. Um, there's there's obviously also sort of interop events, hackathons, plug fests, what do you want to call them, that are sort of more or less formally do this, and some of them are pay to play. Um, so I work for a storage company, NFS, for decades has had regular plug tests with, you know, detailed um, tracking of who implements what and, and how it interoperates. So if, if, you know, you can convince somebody to give you data from those groups, you, you will have a lot. But the ITF itself probably doesn't have that. Yeah, the question of conformance is like a very hard question. Often the developers themselves don't know if their code actually conforms to spec or not. But um, there's a weaker property, which is that you know, do do you know pieces of software used as um, technology specified by the IETF or not? And in some cases, you you might be able to trace the connection somehow. I'm I'm always very interested in this, like uh, how the, how does the I mean IETF works in some way, but then how does the results get used in the companies and open source world and, and so on? Yeah, and I mean yeah, some working. Oh, sorry. sorry, go ahead, Just... Kira. Yeah, very, very, some working groups uh, try to uh, follow where our implementations are and they put this on the wiki or GitHub. And we are actually discussing it in the IAB as well to kind of find a more, little bit more standardized way where to put this information so it's easier to find. Um, so, Mira, that actually, that's where I was sort of going was even though, like, by the way, I didn't know you were, that the IAB was working on this. I would say that, that you have little chance of success of standardizing it. However, going back to Yari's earlier question of, you know, are these things being collected in a way that uh, researchers might use? I have stumbled across numerous um, pages that are either interoperability charts or conformance charts, you know, put together by reasonable groups of people with faces, you know, of folks that we know. It would be, I think, valuable to have at least a, to start a collection of those. Um, so there's, there's, one or two in the DNS world. I know there's certainly some in the HTTP world. Um, I've heard that there are certainly ones in the TCP world, but to at least have a collection of those so that researchers can start seeing maybe how to correlate those into usability data. Yeah, I think the time for our session is winding up. So maybe we stop here and let the next session continue. We can still discuss in the other other um, discussion slots and uh, and also on the chat. So thank you thank all. so much. Thanks so much, Yari, and all the presenters for that session. So we're now heading over to the next session, which it will be chaired by Corinne Ka. Corinne, please come in. I think so much. Um, so the next session is going to be on uh, observations on affiliation and uh, industry industry control, uh, drawing from IETF data. Now there are four papers clustered under this topic. 
um, and six authors, um, four of whom will speak today. And instead of doing uh, paper presentations, we've actually asked these speakers to prepare sort of short provocations um, aimed at generating discussion amongst the speakers and all of us here today. And specifically, we'll talk about the research that is being done on industry affiliation and control and focus on what the real big questions are within this space and why those are interesting. Um, outline the various methods that the authors use to interrogate the data, um, what burning questions remain unanswered, and also what is needed to answer those questions, both during this week, um, but also beyond. Um, and what we'll do is we'll start with the work of Justice Minolia on global competition for leadership positions. Then we'll hear from Nick Doty uh, on researching changing affiliations in the IETF. Um, subsequently, Don will talk about questions of power and culture um, that he thinks should be raised from a civil society perspective. And then finally, uh, we'll zoom in on the work of Elisabetta and Thomas, who work on uh, IoT standards as an example of control in the case of a pretty distinct set of technologies. Now, I'm going to leave it to the speakers to introduce themselves. Uh, and with that, I would like to give the floor to Justice and Odia. Yes, thank you very much. Thank you very much once again to the organizers for having us. Um, my name is Justus Baron. I'm a research associate at Northwestern University, and uh, I've uh, worked on uh, several aspects of IETF data more recently, and uh, this particular project is joint work with Olya Kanevskaya. So, um, Sebastian has already uh, mentioned some of the questions that we are trying to uh, Address or untangle is basically this question of uh, how do individuals uh, conduct, how is individuals' conduct determined? Is it uh, determined by individual aspirations, motivations, characteristics, or is it by uh, affiliation characteristics, uh, industry control? And uh, to, uh, to get to the bottom of these questions, uh, so this is going to be a very hands-on presentation. I'm really focusing on the very manual aspects of the data. So it's basically we're trying to find out who do individuals work for and then uh, try to get some kind of causal identification. Uh, how does who they work for uh, impact what they do within the ITF? And in, specific, in particular, we look at uh, attendees at the ITF meetings as the population, and we look at uh, being appointed to a working group chair position as the uh, outcome variable. And uh, yeah, so basically what we have is we, we look at uh, affiliation information directly in the attendance data and on top of the uh, domains of the emails as two different sources of organization affiliation. And then we clean that, standardize that, and bring it up to the level of the global ultimate owner or parent organization. So. Global ultimate owner obviously is uh, in, tip, uh, in case of corporate affiliations, but it could also be like the university being the parent of a faculty, for example. So you can see that uh, uh, if you could go one slide back, just one second. Um, so what we basically have is like it's we have a, a bit more than 100,000 attendance records where we see that. Uh, in the raw, we have about 40,000 different organization records or different organization spellings, which we standardize up to about 13,000 different parent organizations. Uh, no, uh, sorry, uh, we have uh, 14,000 different uh, organization observations, which we standardize up uh, to about 7,000 parent organizations. And we do a lot of uh, interpolations. So basically, when we see missing records, what we try to first to do is to um, is to look at whether we can see some kind of continuation that uh, if the person has attended a previous meeting and the following meeting with the same type of uh, affiliation, then we then we are willing to interpolate uh, affiliation. Okay, and uh, next slide, please. So uh, what that brings us to is uh, this picture of different types of uh, affiliations. And one thing that I should mention is that we are mostly interested in what we call primary affiliations, which in our head is kind of the employer. So when we observe uh, 
uh, people jumping around between what we call membership organizations and companies or public administrations, then we, uh, then we are overriding the membership organization with the company affiliation information. Uh, and then uh, what we what you basically want to do with that is, uh, next slide please, is to uh, get to an idea of, okay, how does who they work for uh, determine whether they uh, uh, get to a certain position within the IETF? And so uh, we look for some kind of exogenous source of variation in who, can, who people work for so, so that we can uh, uh, causally distinguish between uh, individual characteristics and affiliation characteristics that obviously are vastly correlated. And so we have uh, hand collected uh, information on uh, 260 uh, merger and acquisition events affecting affiliations of individuals participating in the IETF. And then we can see what happens to individuals after the affiliation that they used to work for got acquired, merged, or spinned off from, an, uh, from a previous company structure. And uh, next slide, Pete, which is going to be my next slide, my last slide. So this is basically then the outcome of this econometric analysis where we basically see, okay, what happens after uh, a company uh, structure, affiliation structure changed because of a merger or acquisition event. And we can see that be if because of a merger acquisition event, somebody who did not used to work for one of these top five affiliations, meaning like the five largest affiliations in terms of attendance records. Uh, so basically, if a smaller company gets acquired by one of these, then we see a statistically significant increase in individuals likelihood of being appointed to chair positions. Whereas uh, in case of spin-offs, for example, where we uh, uh, in a smaller organization gets spinned off from a large organization, we see a mildly significant decrease in individuals' likelihood of being appointed to new chair positions. So this is kind of our way of trying to, to track or uh, identify in what ways it could matter who you work for in terms of uh, what, uh, what positions you reach within the IETF. So this is it for now from us. But... Uh, I should say we are relatively new to IETF and as, as an organization and as data, so we are very curious what you have to say and ideas that you could give us. Thanks so much, Justice and Olia. Um, this tills really nicely with the work of Nick on changing affiliations. Um, so I'd like to him to uh, pick up on that work and uh, and tell us what he's done. Uh, sure. Thanks, everyone. Good good to see everyone. I'm not going to uh, present specific uh, work here, but just to sort of Corinne's prompts, talk about some of the work I have done and some of the work or some of the big questions, things I would like to hack on with all of you. Um, so I, I uh, wrote a little in a position paper about the sort of change in affiliation. I think we got to see some examples of that with the last presentation. Um, I've changed my affiliation recently. I, I was previously coming to IETF meetings primarily as an academic doing my dissertation work. Uh, now I'm I'm here uh, now employed by the Center for Democracy and Technology, where I'm advocating for uh, certain particular human rights in internet and web architecture um, proposals. Um, and uh, presumably, we're all familiar with changes in affiliation like that. That's especially common at IETF, um, and I think. Uh, many people have, have noted, it's been raised here already, that there are uh, sort of like interesting fundamental questions about how um, individuals uh, participate mediated through their organizational affiliation, even as that changes over time. Um, so my, uh, so in, in, in each of the questions Corinne has put out for us, I'll, I'll try to talk about both my academic side and, and now my civil society side. Um, so my academic work, my um, dissertation on enacting privacy and internet standards uh, was about how the actual multi-stakeholder standard setting process affects resolution of those sort of public policy disputes over things like privacy. Um, and as I said now, uh, CBT is sort of advocating for that a little more directly. Um, that also affects my methods. So uh, my dissertation work was uh, a mixed methods uh, approach. I did qualitative interviews and and analysis of documents, talking with many participants at W3C and IETF, um, and tried to combine that with some of the quantitative work that we've done with uh, Big Bang and um, or, or using IETF uh, data. Um, 
I, I think in, in civil society, um, we, we still are, are occasionally doing research, but maybe a little less uh, open-ended. So I'm trying to find ways that we can do quantitative metrics to find particular gaps or particular trends that might drive how we're investing uh, public interest technologist time, uh, along with maybe some sort of case reports of what is working or what isn't working uh, to sort of guide those investments. Um, I think the big questions for me are, um, uh, first of all, like how does the changing affiliations of individuals, how does that spread ideas through the community? So um, I, I don't know if people are familiar with this famous paper on institutional isomorphism. Uh, maybe that's a very academic concept, but, but there certainly is some thinking that uh, having people moving between lots of organizations while in that same uh, organizational field might uh, create some sort of common ideas in the field or, or similar organizational structures um, or, or similar concepts. And so I wonder how things like, oh, if, if we get uh, you know, strong principles of privacy uh, at, at one person when they're at one organization, do they take that to their subsequent employers? Um, that's a very big question, but maybe we could just start by trying to identify this week start by trying to identify oh, what are the tra trends in changing affiliation like wh where are people moving from what types of organizations to what others um, the other big question that i always have in mind is um, where are the different sectors by that i mean sort of private industry or, or civil society nonprofit or government regulators or academics um, where are those different sectors represented in ITF or other technical standard setting processes, and where are they not? Um, so that, that might be interesting for me just because I want to see, oh, where do we not have any consumer advocates uh, even, even present? Um, uh, but also that might try, try to be a starting point for us to figure out when uh, people are having an impact. Uh, are, are, are academics making a difference because they're participating in these sorts of groups but not these other ones? On the needs, I'm, I'm looking forward to what we can hack on this week, um, but I think uh, it would be especially useful for me to know like what's a good data set for types of organizations. I feel like we often have this like little casual informal people like look up the, you know, the TLD or something to figure out if it's a corporate organization or, or we try to classify it really quickly and do, oh, these are ISPs and these are, uh, you know, browser vendors or something. Uh, if we had a good systematic data set, that would be um, much more useful that we could match up. Um, and I think also it, it might be useful for many of us to just have some common data format about, oh, this person's affiliation changed from this to this at this time, so that when we're grabbing that from all these different possible data sources, we can then uh, share it downstream for, for other people that are working on it. So I, I think there's a lot for us to do there, but that's, that's my overview. Hey, Nick, thanks so much. Um, that uh, raises a lot of relevant new questions that we can that we can use going into the hackathon this this week. Um, and I really also appreciate you bringing your own changing affiliation uh, into the discussion, like a, a little qualitative ethnographic nugget. Um, then I would like to uh, invite Don to talk about their work. Um, and I think that again ties in really nicely to the work of Nick as Don also works for a uh, civil society organization, which means the kind of questions that you ask uh, are perhaps a little bit different than from strict research perspective. So with that, um, Don, the floor is yours. Thanks, Corinne. Um, I also don't have a presentation, but just going to share a few words with everyone. Uh, my name is Don and I'm with Article 19, diving into the intersection of human rights and internet infrastructure, as well as how internet infrastructure can impact uh, the rights of users and communities at large. So since decisions made at the IETF um, can impact the flow of information across the internet, we're interested to better understand how the power dynamics of the IETF um, and how power holders influence the development of internet protocols and how they're also produced. And this could really help us as an organization, as well as civil society um, in general, to, to determine where best to effectively engage um, with companies where these protocols could have implications on the everyday user, as well as more vulnerable and marginalized communities. So what we're also very interested in is also related to affiliation. 
Um, and we're curious to see how the IETF's diversity efforts have also been reflected within um, IETF discussions and the development of standards. So I think that would also really connect quite well with upcoming session on um, community and diversity. I'm really looking forward to hearing a bit more about that soon as well. Um, for both of these questions that we've been thinking about, um, we're thinking about in terms of how we're doing this research is both through quantitative analyses of participation data um, through working group data, um, such as mailing list archives, um, meeting minutes, and corresponding that with participant affiliation based on organizations, companies, and um, the various sectors. And then we also thought about um, qualitative interviews and desk research, which will also supplement our analysis to better understand the complex dynamics that are occurring um, and actively shaping IETF discussions. One of our burning questions that we've been thinking about is how can we correlate affiliations within participation data? So both mailing lists, blue sheets, attendee lists published on the IETF website to observe where certain companies and sectors are focusing their efforts within the IETF. Um, this is also fairly similar to what Nick had just mentioned as well in order to be able to find um, what is shaping, what, what is actively shaping um, internet protocols and determining where civil society can best engage. And then further to this, how does this shape who authors as well as the development leading up to the RFC? Um, and so in terms of that, um, the biggest need for, um, for um, our, us is, is fairly similar to what Nick had just mentioned in terms of being able to find out what, com uh, what sort of systemic data sets are available um, with regards to affiliation um, in order for us to be able to utilize the various tools to collect and analyze affiliation data. Perfect. Thank you so much. Um, again, it is really good to get a sense of not just what can be done with the data, but also what is needed uh, from the data from the perspective of a different kind of stakeholder groups that are participating within the IETF. Um, and with that, I would like to move to our last provocation, um, for which I want to give the floor to Elisaveta and Thomas and their work on IoT standards. Please go ahead. Hi, everybody. Um, for some reason, I cannot open the presentation. I don't know, Thomas, if you can try, but I can start without that. Um, so uh, we've started off our research as part of our master's dissertation at uh, University College London last year. And uh, our dissertation was focused on the geopolitics of emerging digital technologies. And we were trying to understand uh, how political and commercial um, implications affect the multi-stakeholder procedures within it, the ACOs. Uh, this was a group project, so we were looking at three different technologies and me and Thomas were focused on Internet of Things. And um, what we we used, we didn't go through the IETF data, we used one and term standard uh, as main case study for our research. And uh, what we did, we were trying to understand if there is um, there are any alliances uh, between different types of the, different stakeholders within one and term standard and we tried to understand uh, which types of the stakeholders are represented uh, at the discussion and which are excluded and um, also we looked at the national representativeness um, yeah thank you uh, at the national or regional represent representativeness uh, within one and term standard. And um, what we found uh, was that um, there is, uh, we, we found some basically influence um, based on some geopolitical interests. And we found that, for example, Chinese and US stakeholders dropped out from the discussion uh, because of some international uh, conflicts uh, between the states. At the same time, uh, we found that some national policies, especially science, technology, innovation policies of different countries, affect the development of one and term standard because, for example, um, uh, they were interested in developing smart cities technologies. So the one and term standard was adopted in Korea and in, the, in India as national standard, which gave it like a huge push and helped it to scale internationally. And um, so right now we are zooming into our research and trying to bring more case studies into it and uh, we are also doing some interviews with the SDO's representative uh, rep uh, SDO's members 
and uh, we are trying to um, understand if there is some geopolitical and national um, influence uh, within IoT industry and how it affects the standard development within different SDOs. Um, Thomas, do you want to? Yeah, no worries. Um, thanks, Elizabeth, and hello, everyone. Um, so the, the questions which naturally sort of extended from our research are, is there a match between the industry alliances within STOs and other international alliances? And how would we identify if international industry alliances function politically or whether with intent or as nudged by some sort of path dependency set by government policy? Um, so is it just a case of identifying and coding a few keywords from emails or meeting minutes, like any mention of, of government, state or alliance, or is something sort of lost when we look at these words in vitro? Um, so underlying all how we answer all these questions, uh, we thought was the more fundamental one of how do we measure at what point a preference becomes an influence? And we think that question is really at the base of our kind of methodology. Um, and although, although that question is very methodologically like interesting, um, it does require a few needs, which we're currently in the process of exploring, um, namely methods, uh, for example, you know, clear information about affiliation and word analysis, um, data through uh, stated affiliations, mailing lists and emails, and uh, technical knowledge for us um, in coding, you know, coming from a public policy background. We have used R and Tableau um, for uh, one end-to-end -end data that we've looked at, and we're currently starting to use Big Bang to look at IETF data. Uh, but there are a number of tools out there, some of which are better suited to certain formats of data than others. So this technical knowledge for us is, is constantly evolving. So thank you. Perfect. Well, that rounds up all of the uh, the speakers and the provocations um, and gives us a good bit of time to um, discuss what, uh, what's next in terms of you know, how we measure and do research on industry control. And before I open up um, to the floor, I want to take the moderator's prerogative and ask uh, a question that tries to tie together some of the different bits and bobs of information that, that the author shared with us. And I want to start with um, uh, Olia and Justice as well as Nick, um, because you all consider how affiliation, um, but also changes in affiliation influence standardization. Um, and that is obviously a really difficult dynamic to capture just from data on the mailing list, I presume. So I wanted to ask each of you if you could elaborate a little bit on how you measured or captured affiliate, uh, affiliation changes uh, and what findings you found while doing that. Um, Nick, you want to go first or should I? Uh... Okay. So, um, what we've been using as basic first input is the attendance lists of ITF meetings and uh, some of these uh, explicitly state affiliations and others don't. For those that don't, uh, many of those have email addresses where we use a domain name as affiliation. And then basically it's it's just a matter of cleaning. So we, we create like panels where we can like uh, get the series and we try to standardize and harmonize uh, affiliation names as much as possible. And then uh, you you get uh, a lot of situations where people jump around between affiliations a lot. So it's, it's people like wearing multiple hats who are affiliated with multiple organizations and they choose different affiliations at different times. So we try to get rid of these. So we try to uh, identify what we, call, what we call clear or clean affiliation changes, which is basically a unique change, which is not a back and forth kind of movement. And uh, where both before and after the change, that individual has at least attended two meetings with the, the previous and with the new affiliation. So that would what we what we call an affiliation change. So there's a little bit of arbitrary uh, criteria in there, but just to to get like a cleaner, consistent data set. And and what we find is that about 25% of the IETF attendees in our data have one of these affiliation changes over their span of uh, participation in, in the IETF meetings. Um, and and then like it's we we categorize these into different categories of affiliation change. So there are some that we call internal, 
which is basically uh, once you standardize information up to the level of the parent, you get rid of an affiliation change. So it's basically uh, uh, between different uh, sub-organizations of the same organization. Then there are these uh, uh, changes that I'm primarily interested in because they provide us with causal identification, which is changes ex exogenously induced by something that happened to the organization, not by something that happened to that particular individual. So for example, a merger uh, Alcatelucin being bought by Nokia uh, is, uh, induces an affiliation change for quite a, a large number of individuals in the data and this kind, this type of things. And then, like there is uh, this naked employment change where one individual really changes affiliation from one organization that continues to exist to another organization that already existed before. So that's really a, a transition of the individual himself from one organization to the other. So these are kind of the different categories. Uh, the one that we use for identification in our paper is actually quite rare. I mean, that's just like 250 individuals, I think, that uh, that actually affected by that in our data. That's what we use as source of identification because we are really concerned about this uh, correlation, obviously, that certain types of individuals are just susceptible of being hired by a certain type of organization and that would completely pollute our analysis. So we try to break that correlation and that's what we use. I, I think it's great that you've, uh, I, I think maybe you're a little bit farther along, you've, you've done a specific piece of research, and so we, we get to look at your method in, in particular, and I, I really appreciate your sharing that. Um, I think the things I've done with affiliation, with actually different ways to infer or gather that affiliation data are, are a little bit earlier, but at a recent ITF hackathon, um, we, I tried to grab some data from the data tracker and match it up to different data sources. So. Um, GitHub, people have GitHub profiles, and the, the GitHub profile can include your company, for example. Uh, so I, I tried to match it up against that as, a, as an interesting data source. Uh, for IETF, that was not very successful. It, it, didn't, it didn't work very much. OK, well, we also have uh, meeting attendance records. I think, I think that's what you're talking about primarily. And I do think that's extremely valuable. If you are a regular IETF attendee, um, well, you're going to go to the meeting, and you're probably going to fill in uh, like an important affiliation into that. Uh, field and, and that can be very useful. Um, the other thing is that the, the document authorship at, at IETF in particular um, includes includes some information or, or like you know some actual raw data about uh, who you said you were uh, working with at that time. Uh, that that can be useful data. That's obviously like a very small subset of IETF participants who are actually authoring documents. Um, uh, and and it can be a little bit messier because it's it's sort of uh, plain text data. But on the other hand, it's often like uh, you know you you can you can get some very prominent participants or or people who are likely to be sending many many messages to your mailing list and and participating very effectively who are um, who are going to be authoring documents. And so it can be a valuable source to to match up data, even if it's not going to cover the you know hundreds of thousands of people that have ever sent an email to an IETF mailing list. Um, and also, I think the other thing is that it's going to be interesting uh, as we apply it to other uh, standard setting bodies that might have different sources of data or, or different sort of conventions. So uh, we've had some colleagues working on uh, 3GPP. Uh, for them, it seems like, well, actually, the, the domain of your email address can actually be uh, extremely effective, whereas we know at ICF or, or W3C that that is not very useful at trying to figure out your employer. Um, so it's likely to vary for these different organizations, and I think we should just be aware of that when we're looking for affiliation data. So that, um, cer certain techniques are going to be more or less useful in, in different contexts, um, and and uh, yeah, and and we're and we're just going to have to explore that. I, honestly, the, the other thing I wanted to just re react to was that I, I love this idea about some people are just going to have multiple affiliations that that, that they just do identify sometimes with. Uh, different organizations that that they you know people say oh I'm wearing this hat at this moment. Um, I understand that that's going to be messy data, but it's also potentially very useful, especially for this sort of isomorphism question or this idea of, of ideas being spread. Uh, is, is that actually we, we kind of want that? Maybe maybe people who went through went a university and still have some connection to it are going to spread this kind of approach uh, into different uh, employing organizations. So. Uh, let's, let's, let's not completely give up on that, even if it's going to be messy data.
Thanks so much to both. Uh, as an anthropologist, I uh, very much appreciate messy data um, and uh, agree with Nick that part of part of the trick here is to be able to keep the kind of nuances uh, around how people participate in the IETF and make sure that whatever research we do on that doesn't sort of flatten the, the complicated realities of what it means to be in this space. Um, on which note, we have another 15 minutes for discussion, so I would just like to open it up uh, and perhaps Neil's sitting right, right there can help me manage the question and answer. Um, yeah, I guess I'll jump in on the one um, on the queue right now. So, I mean, I, I think you set me up really well, Corinne, because I have a suggestion for nuance, um, which is that I think affiliation by stakeholder group might be more useful or actually um, a proposed framework in which tracking affiliation changes based on the stakeholder group. So maybe it's better if I explain um, a couple of examples. So one is um, if you track government participation across SDOs, you actually are going to find there's a lot of um, private sector industry representatives that are also representing a government. So that can get rather confusing. Um, it's true for civil society as well. You find sometimes governments will ask civil society to represent them. It's just not as common. Um, another example, and this was sparked, um, this thought was sparked when you were talking, Nick, about, you know, actually tracking people's affiliation over time, because when I think about civil society and I'm used to working with human rights organizations, that can be kind of dangerous. You're kind of providing this like network mapping, not network in the Internet sense, but, you know, in the people sense that can actually be rather vulnerable if that's sort of done. It just implicates, you know, it can have a lot of implications and get people in trouble and that sort of thing. So I don't know if we want to do that always for civil society, for example. And then I guess in conclusion, the reason why I might apply different ways of tracking based on stakeholder group is also because I think at the end of the day, we're doing this to track power, influence, and, and, and that I think there should be different standards for what constitutes power and influence, um, we're actually a little bit, I think we're a little bit more worried about um, industry level influence than we are like with, you know, human rights organizations influence. Like, I, I just feel like there might be a different approach. So that's all I would suggest is that as we dig deeper into trying to come up with a framework that we actually not treat every single participant exactly the same, but we try to, um, you know, really take into consideration um, the, the dynamics that means, you know, you would have, different standards for different stakeholder groups. And then actually stakeholder group might be a really just a good place to start. Feel free, uh, feel free to respond. Yeah, uh, I, I think that the way you categorize affiliations is really subservient to the question that you're asking. I mean, it's, uh, I'm, I'm fully, aware or like it's I, I i really struggled with these fuzziness in the in the affiliation choices but it's uh i i think that all my choices or all our choices in the actual research design were then guided by this idea that we were interested in tracking whether being affiliated with a large industrial affiliation has an impact on on your influence in in the sdo so then that basically meant that whenever I have a choice between multiple affiliations and one of these affiliations is a large powerful industry group, then I will choose that one just because uh, that's just the question that I'm interested in. And uh, it also means that I'm happy to just use 250 individuals to answer my question, even though there are 40,000 individuals in my data, because these are the individuals that provide me with clean identification. I'm not pretending that I, I have full comprehensive coverage of affiliation in the IHF. I'm just uh, very consciously selecting a very small group of individuals that provides me with clean observations for this particular question that I'm asking. So I think that if the goal is to create a, a, a platform where different people working on affiliation data can uh, collaborate and then that can be used for different questions, that would be a different thing. And I, I'm not sure that what I have done would be readily usable for that. 
but I, I think that what I did or what you what we did is is, is specifically usable, is, is specifically applicable to people interested in that specific group of affiliation, which is like large industrial stakeholders. And that's that guided basically the entire affiliation categorization from the start. And I, I would suspect that this this is true for many different research questions that like it's there's not one single categorization that, that works for all of them. So I see um, Robert and Wes are in the queue. Go. So I think um, the question I was going to ask is mostly answered, but I'm going to frame it with a specific instance. Are you able, have, have you had any success at seeing through consulting um, organizations or just individuals that are consulting? that present a consistent organization name and email address, but are attending from meeting to meeting representing different um, large other organizations. And a variation of that question, um, the IETF community in particular has a large number of participants that have very carefully curated on, on at least an email um, address identity that is bound to themselves, even though they change affiliation um, regularly. And if that's something that um, the analysis uh, detects and, and, and accounts for. Just, just to quickly jump in on that, that is like a, a very interesting thing about IETF data compared to some other data sources that um, I, I think ITF people in, in particular, maybe it's an interesting cultural thing about how we think about email and the internet, um, uh, uh, use, use those personal email addresses or personal domains across affiliation. And I do think that is something that we can uh, measure that, that we do have data. Um, I, I'm also noticing just from uh, looking at some early graphs I made at a, at a recent hackathon, um, that the VPN consortium can be extremely highly uh, present, uh, like a very active participant. Well, that that might be one person. Some of you know that person who who is working on behalf of a of a larger um, group. Um, I, and I and I don't think it's I don't think it's bad to have that sort of consulting uh, uh, position in in the data that that. We, we, we both should know that that might have some corporate influence, but also that there are going to be individuals who are taking that role, um, uh, who, who, who might have their, their own interests, even though they have some other affiliation. Yeah, I mean, for our study, what? I think that, sorry. No, no, no so go, go ahead, Justice, I was too fast. I think that we we are not able to to go beyond what people are willingly providing on their uh, registration for the meeting. I mean, what we do is that we have four different SDOs. So if people participate in different SDOs, including in SDOs where people have to participate as representative of a particular member organization, then we would have that information from another organization if they're participating with exactly the same name and. Uh, contact information, for example, but that's quite rare, actually. So, I mean, yeah, we lose a lot of information. We lose a lot of individuals for which we can't do this type of analysis. So it's it's really basically uh, uh, it's not comprehensive population data in that sense that we work with. It's we we use that data where uh, where we are lucky that we have the information, and there are a lot of things that would bias us against finding something, because, for example, people already had. Uh, some kind of uh, undisclosed corporate affiliation with that new organization. So if that was the case, then you wouldn't expect that this affiliation change has any causal impact. So the fact that we still are able to find some causal effect is, I, I think that we're uh, we're probably understating the true effect. Like all these things should bias us against finding anything. So it's I'm less concerned given that we do find something but it it i would be concerned if we wouldn't be finding anything then i i would not know whether it's just because of all these 
measurement errors or would be a curve affiliation really does not matter, but it, it does seem to matter. Perfect. All right. With five more minutes to go, I think we still have um, uh, Wes and Paul in the queue. So I would like to invite them to ask a question and then uh, we'll have an opportunity to round up and move to the next session. Great. Um, so, I mean, there's a number of interesting things in this space that I think would be fascinating to study. Uh, in particular, you know, do affiliation changes lead to different work or topic shifts, you know, uh, between people? And I think that's hard to detect in a number of ways. Uh, speaking personally, I've worked for research organizations where our work has uh, been tied to research grants. So, you know, what I work on within the IETF has shifted over years um, based on the research grants that I've been working on. Uh, whereas at other times, my affiliation has changed, uh, I think, five times, four of which were actually resulted in buyouts where my work didn't change because the actual contract moved along. Uh, the research contract had sort of actually moved along with my affiliation change, uh, which led me to the final question, which is, could we actually detect opinion shifts after an affiliation change use you know some natural language processing or something to determine that somebody actually changed their their opinion on a technical subject uh you know based on some sort of labeling and tagging uh where after they after they flipped affiliations they actually changed their viewpoint on something thanks i want to invite paul to also ask his question and then the uh the authors can answer them together uh because of the time restriction it's a very quick question of whether how how the data collection looked at um, people who are clearly consultants um, uh, working for organizations um, or governments that were not terribly popular. That is in the IETF, and I know this happens in 3GPP as well, that uh, uh, gov some governments will in fact only send uh, consultants and the consultants will identify themselves as consultants, not as working for the government, but they're clearly doing the government work. And if you look at what they're doing, so I, I was wondering whether that uh, kind of thing, you know, in the IETF, most most of us know, you know, for example, who Russ Housley works for, or when I was working for Russ, you know, things like that. Um, did you include that as as you know, essentially proxies for uh, places where you didn't want to identify yourself? Um, as the as the primary stakeholder. I mean, in our study, like it's the only the only instance in which we would be able to do that is if um, if, for example, somebody let's say works. Uh, for a large company and at the same time has a small individual consulting company in his own name and sometimes attends in the name of a large company and sometimes in the name of the small consulting company and there is like some kind of switching back and forth between these then we would what we what i called interpolate I, we would override the small consulting company with the name of the large company but for that it, the name of the large company would have to appear in at least one registration for a meeting otherwise that would just stay as a small consulting company. And that's just measurement error, if you wish, or it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a limitation of the, of, the, of our ability to, uh, to actually accurately track the real primary affiliation that we're interested in. So, yeah, we're, we're quite aware of the, of the limitations of, of the, of our ability to, to actually track and measure affiliation. So it's, but my defense is always like it's uh, these would always bias us against finding anything. So we believe that the effects that we measure are probably larger in in in, in reality than what we can than what we can show. Perfect. Well, then um, thank you so much for for the questions and for the answers. Um, I. You want to stop us here to make sure that there's enough time for the next session, which I believe will be under the excellent guidance of Wes. So, uh, handing over to the green green room now. Yep. All right. Thank you very much. Um, so, uh, this next section will be on community and diversity. Just as a reminder, after this, this is 45 minutes long, and there will be a I think a 30 minute break. So. 
uh, you will get a, a break here shortly. Um, I'm the session chair and we've asked three people, Priyanka, Mallory, and Lars to sort of give their high level summary presentations in five minutes or so per person. Uh, so I will turn it over to them first, starting with Priyanka. Um, uh, is the slides visible or do I have to share the slides? Uh, I don't know. Uh, did somebody see the slides? I did share them. Did they go away or are they still there? Do you see them? Yep, oh, they're good. So you, you should be able to go. Right. So, um, I, uh, I'm a PhD student who has submitted her thesis uh, to uh, Indian Institute of Technology, Kharagpur, in mining personality traits and uh, homophilic uh, groups of behave, uh, behaviorally uh, similar groups from enterprise social networks. And um, I've used text mining techniques, time series analytic techniques, and uh, graph mining techniques, uh, and some psycholinguistic attributes. Um, but uh, to generate these insights. Um, but uh, I also work full time at uh, Tata Consultancy Services and um, uh, as a research scientist. And before that, I was uh, uh, in my past life, I was uh, working in wireless networking, studying how DNS can work in mobile ad hoc networks. And I worked at Redback Networks on the routing uh, issues which was uh, uh, which was acquired by Ericsson. So, um, because of my own interest, I got in, involved with the Indian Internet Engineering Society and the Industry Network Technologies uh, Council, uh, especially with their IPv6 webinars, etc. And I started uh, seeing that ITS is an organization; it's a voluntary global organization where its communication and activities are recorded. And they're available for analysis and study as we learned about the ITF data and the other tools that are available. So uh, I could see that I can uh, I can um, apply some of the uh, my findings from what I've applied in commercial enterprises or other open source uh, uh, communities like Stack Exchange, Enron Email Dataset, or the Linux kernel mailing list to the ITF. And uh, my understanding till now from uh, getting involved with the ITF, it's, uh, especially with the pre-ITF meeting that was held in this part of the world uh, a few years ago, is that uh, the diversity, inclusion, and representation uh, processes of the ITF make the consensus process robust. And uh, what I've observed um, actually with the V6Ops uh, mailing list that I, I've been going through a little bit, is that the uh, consensus mechanisms going from a draft to an RFC and um, to the final uh, internet standard? They depend. Uh, they depend on many times on uh, advocacy, on advocacy by others, um, and as the speakers before us talked about, that advocacy may be affiliation based of the organization. They may be on other demographic label based, but. Um, my uh, what I'm from my research, what I am trying to bring out is that people may be multidimensional. They may have different demographic labels at, attributed to them, not just their, not just their affiliation labels, which keep changing over time, but also their gender labels, their geograph geographical locations, and other things. So their sense of community uh, may not be appropriated by their observable demographic indicators as to what they would advocate for, what they would influence on, may could be done in a purely data-driven manner to understand uh, how some members can find consensus building in their activity. Uh, next slide, please. I don't know how to go to the next slide. Okay. So some of the questions that I think are interesting are um, because of COVID-19, a lot of, of the ITF and uh, all across the world, all kinds of organizations, they have moved to virtual only interactions. 
But has that increased diversity and inclusion, especially in the IDF? How do you measure that? Do you measure that with increased participation, uh, increased number of diversity in terms of uh, drafts going to RFCs, um, so on and so uh, So there are many statistical ways to identify that based on the data that from data tracker and ma uh, mail archives. Um, now that ITF data and Big Bang and other tools are easily able to get this. Now also, uh, uh, what how much opinion diversity is there in working groups? One of the things that I've heard is that uh, certain issues become long-standing issues and people keep forgetting about what was the discussion that happened long before and uh, somebody, if they, they are not re repeating those concerns and they get lost. So how much opinion diversity is there in the consensus process? And for newcomers, this is something that I think is important for newcomers or people who are, uh, who are uh, uh, underrepresented, how do they identify advocates to uh, see these questions being uh, there, uh, uh, what they're saying, uh, find a voice. So uh, using this, uh, these ideas, um, uh, some of my work could be, or our work can be uh, used to uh, further understand the actual organization structure and the norms that are there in the idea. Um, next slide. Take a second, Ms. Shift. You should see the last one. Yeah. So the the so I was uh, because there's a lot of uh, understanding here that um, affiliation is important, and uh, you already see that the rough and noisy nature of affiliations or finding how affiliations is related to power and influence. But a data-driven manner of addressing these uh, questions without considering them from an affiliation perspective or from a directly from a gender perspective, if you're taking people based upon how they are interacting based on the on what uh, what opinions they put up and how much they are engaged with uh, the processes, uh, how they're engaged based on that comes from the participation data from the data tracker, the minutes of the meeting as to uh, who is saying what because meetings are a place where a lot of decisions are getting take, taking place. And then mailing lists where a lot of uh, opinions are flowing across about the drafts, uh, which are full of technical uh, technical uh, um, domain specific words, as they say in NLP, which is uh, uh, for which the tooling is also uh, important. It's not like general purpose. We're not just talking about uh, say apples or oranges. We're talking about uh, TCP and IP, which uh, from a text mining perspective. Uh, poses a significant challenge. Uh, where's Arvin? Okay, so uh, Priyanka, we do need to wrap up. So, uh, anything else to add? It looks yes. Like so the, yes, this is the slide. Thanks, Wes. So this is all the work that I've done. Uh, one of those which will be interesting for us to look at on the ITF data. This is a published uh, thing. Is to identify leaders and fine grain communities who have coherent topics just by the number of times somebody engages with the ITF per month, let's say. So that's their time series of engagement. And uh, based on this, we cluster people, how behaviorally different they are. And it turns out that this clustering mechanism is so powerful that people who are in the same cluster, they are generally interested in the same kind of topics. So this is an interesting uh, uh, technique to use. Just like that, there is a graph mining technique which is under review and um, some psycholinguistic uh, techniques. So I'll be interested to know from the this meeting, so what are the questions that are important to the IAB and uh, how to um, take this forward? Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Priyanka. I appreciate your uh, summary. Uh, Mallory, I'll turn it over to you. Hey, everybody. So. Um... As you'll note, I'm starting out with a rather provocative question um, because I think when we're talking about um, diversity of participation, we could just extrapolate to the to the total endpoint and just replace all of us engaged in the IATF with feminists and then um, try to see if that has any consequence. So I guess I'm um, couching our discussion here today about data-driven research um, in a larger sort of approach to um, actually determining what is what are the consequences. So 
Um, next slide, please. Um, uh, so in order to do that, um, I apologize, but I'm going to have to give a little bit of context. So I'm, I'm going way forward in um, my sort of question. I'm also going to go back a bit because I think the context uh, really matters. And especially if we're trying to get at these like overarching deep dive, big questions about um, diversity and community inclusion, uh, we actually have to do that. Um, so anyway, um, in this particular case, we're talking about gender representation from an intersectional feminist perspective, um, we're looking at a power analysis that began asking, uh, with asking this question, imagine a feminist internet. That question was posed um, in 2014. And as a result, um, it was both a sort of movement building activity to understand what are some of the um, issues relevant to um, intersectional feminism in the digital age. And um, and also, it was a movement building activity to actually build a movement of people who are aware of that. So it was both substance and process, and you'll understand that theme as we um, move forward. So next slide, please. Um, so one of the major milestones in that work since 2014 was something called the feminist principles of the internet. So being able to coalesce um, an un like an uncovering of the various issues. Um, often means that, you know, as civil society or folks practicing movement building, that you actually then start writing them down. Um, and so this is what that uh, question, you know, imagine a feminist internet resulted in. So you can go to feministinternet.org and you can check out um, these various principles. I think there are 17 or so around five different issue areas. And part of the, it, it didn't stop there. Part of the point of then articulating these principles was to actually see them then in action. So a variety of different movement based act actions from all over the world um, then resulted from this. And, and so I'm gonna deep dive into one of them that actually is happening with the IETF. So um, next slide, please. So I consider this draft that's currently um, in the IRTF um, co-authored by me and Juliana Guerra from Derechos Digitales. She's based out of Colombia and based out of the U.S. I'm with the Center for Democracy and Technology. Um, we consider this work actually a sort of branch of that movement work um, to take those principles and try to apply them to, to figure out, uh, you know, what um, are the relevant overlap, overlapping pieces between this sort of principled approach to how the internet should work if it's an intersectional feminist um, analysis um, and how it actually does work and what are some of the interesting uh, guidance maybe. So next slide, please. Um, so yeah, I think we had our first draft maybe in 2018, if I'm not wrong. Um, we aim to do similar because this is also happening in the Human Rights Protocol Considerations Research Group. We sort of modeled it after how 8280 looked at the Universal Declaration of Human Rights because it's a set of principles, you can, you know, sort of do a, a sort of same thing. And we, um, next slide, please, um, went ahead and thought about skipping over the part where we articulate every single different piece of analysis and actually just do a sort of useful document as sort of guidelines for um, folks who are, you know, developing internet protocols. What are the high level points you might want to keep in mind? Um, and here are all the references and the context for being able to do that. Um, and so that's sort of the current uh, trajectory of the draft. But then there are some questions that have made us pause a bit. So I want to present those because I think that they, um, yeah, perfect, Wes, um, that they sort of get at some of these larger questions that we're all trying to answer right now today, especially in this um, section. So we want to consider if we mightn't detangle the process from the substance a little bit, and I cannot decide what to do. I am honestly torn. Even sitting here in the session with you, listening to all of these provocative questions, I don't know what the right answer is, if we should detangle the process from the substance or if they're inherently important to study at the same time. So if you can go to the next slide. Um, I think that if we did decide to include data-driven research and the process, if you will, in, is a, in addition to the, con, uh, the content and the substance of what we're doing, we would have to answer sort of three sub-questions um, that others I note in this section are also answering for themselves exactly the same as me, but just from their own different perspective. One is, um, if you can go to the next slide, 
Um, one is that if we um, actually try to measure diversity of participation, can Big Bang do that? Um, is it meaningful? I mean, we had the same conversation with affiliation, right? If you can actually say, um, and then Priyanka also troubles it, right? If you could actually just say like, um, you know, this is the quality that we're tracking. Um, can, can uh, you know, can it, does it have, you know, does it have a consequence? And also, um, how do you get to that point and can you do it over time? And isn't that more meaningful than a snapshot of today? Next uh, slide, please. Um, another open question then is, um, it doesn't actually necessarily talk about power either. Participation doesn't tell you whether or not, um, you know, something, even leadership particip participation doesn't give you, um, at the end of the day, an analysis about whether or not it's changed outcomes. So can basic data give us um, influence or the other side of it is marginalization? If it can, how do you actually achieve that measurement? Um, do you continue to measure it? And then also, um, at the end of the day, does the data actually give us um, something of, of consequence that we can action and do something about? I'm not totally sure. So then uh, the final slide, I think. Yeah. Um, I think that, you know, like I said, this is the one that I really can't, I can't decide about. Um, you know, we could also do something more interesting with a separate document as well. So we could think about, you know, De, uh, entangling rather the, the process question and the substance question, because that seems like the right answer from a political perspective, but then it points to future work in which you do a deeper dive, maybe on the um, participation or, or process questions. That's one option. Um, and the next slide, I think there is maybe one more that's just pointers. Yeah. You can't leave this up because you're moving on to the next um, presentation, Wes, but um, I had this here just in case people wanted to be able to follow up on this. And it's also, I think, in the paper that's on the wiki. So thanks. And I would certainly encourage everybody to post links that are of relevant stuff to the uh, Slack uh, channel as well as the slides uh, will be available uh, afterwards as well. So, all right. Thank you very much, Mallory. Uh, it was perfect. Let's go on to Lars. Hey, hi. Hope you can hear me. Yes. Um, so this will be a slightly different presentation in the sense that I, I'm sort of looking at it specifically from sort of quote unquote ITF leadership and, and um, why we're particularly interested in using some of the data we have to, to get some insights into the organization and participation and diversity and so on. Next slide, please. Um, so, so before I start, though, I want to actually thank you all for working on this. I think it's very important and it matters and sort of, again, uh, ITF quote unquote leadership sort of really pays attention and we're always interested when people sort of post uh, research that they've done using various data and basically say, hey, you know, look at this. We, we um, you know, show a trend here that, that we didn't know existed. And, and part of that is because, as Niels pointed out uh, in his intro, we actually have shockingly little data about the organization, right? Um, the ITF is, you know, we're not running an ERP software or anything like that, right? We have a bunch of data and we have, um, you know, some very you know, few statistics that we're doing, many of which are sort of, you know, focused around, you know, who's participating and how, how often are they participating and so on. But we have, like, really no overview of who uh, our participants are and how homogeneous or, or not they are. And anything anything that we can get is, is better than nothing. And so if, if you continue to work on this, um, please send us pointers to your work. Um, but basically, the, the hard question for, for those of us sort of in leadership, we try to figure out what should we do to, with this organization, what should we focus on, and what should we, you know, maybe ignore. It, we really don't know who we are, and and there's a lot of sort of bias inherently in all of this because everybody sort of thinks that they are the average, right, or that their ITF experience is the the general ITF experience, and that is certainly not true if, as we anecdotally know. But we don't know how different the organization is amongst the various axes and. We need to understand this better to sort of serve the, the participants and the organization. Next slide. Um, so one example is, is this is taken from the 2021 community survey that Jay did, which was the first one ever. Um, um, and one thing that was sort of interesting to me specifically was that, you know, 33% of people said, have, said they use their own personal time um, to, to work on, on ITF things, which is surprisingly high, or at least to some of us, surprisingly high, given that next slide, um, you have other viewpoints being expressed in the past. So for example, Randy Bush, who some of you might know, wrote this uh, 
position paper, let's call it, in 2005, basically calling us the Internet Vendor Task Force and ranting about how nobody could possibly participate because it's a full-time job and, and we're all just here to sort of build features into routers, right? And maybe both of these are true or maybe something has changed. Uh, the scary thing is we don't actually know, right? So, so um, we don't know if the ITF is now more focused on, you know, developing things that matter. Uh, and I'm not saying that, you know, nerd knobs on routers don't matter, but maybe other things matter more. But we really don't know, right? And these are very individual viewpoints here. 33% basically say, you know, my own time goes to the IETF or some of it. And, and Randy says, you know, it's all, it's all just vendors. Um, and then colloquially, we also know there's no operators around, um, although there are operators around. So we really have little data. Next slide. And to sort of why do we care about this? We, we, we were like uh, non com elected into various bodies and positions, right? Sort of. I have two quotes here about the profile and the mission, and you can find that like under itf.org slash about, right? So we're supposedly a large open international community of, of people with various backgrounds. And we sort of care about the evolution of the internet and that it smoothly operates. And we have a mission, right? And the mission is we want to make that internet work better by doing various things, right? The challenge is um, how do we enable the organization that has given itself like these goals and this mission to actually function well, right? And and the answer is it's really hype because we don't really know who participates and why and how can we increase you know diversity of participation for example or how can we strengthen underrepresented parts of the community because we don't have any ground truth here right and and as a small aside we obviously also want to enable sort of evolution of those two things the profile and the mission if you will but but let's take that on the side so data really matters and we don't have it right and there's sort of two sort of you know um MBA style quotes, right? If you can't measure it, you can't improve it, which is certainly true. Um, we're measuring things, we're just not analyzing it enough, right? We, we're gathering data, which is good, but but we need to we need to actually continuously um, look at it be, before we can do something with it, and we're not. And and you guys are now starting, which is great. And then the the reason we in leadership want to do this, right? Because there's management and there's leadership and there's a difference. And this is sort of what the second quote is, right? Sort of management is you know don't screw up. And leadership is do the right things, which are not the same thing. And I sort of found this picture of this sort of elephant that you might have uh, seen before, right? That if you, if the elephant is the ITF, right, depending on where you look, it looks very different to very different participants. And it would be good to know how it looks from various angles, right? And it would be even better to understand that it's sort of all the same thing. And you know, uh, what what's the size of the trunk versus the size of the body versus the size of the tail? Um, and I'm, I'm hopefully we're going to get some data out of this. Um, if we're continuing down this process of analyzing gathering the data. And I think that's the last slide. Thank you. Thanks very much, Lars. Uh, so those are three great presentations. One of the things that um, I think is consistent across them all, I'll go ahead and stop sharing here. Uh, cancel. That didn't make it go away. The stop sharing button is missing. <laughs> I think we might have just uh, lost Wes, so he really ended the presentation, but also his participation. He, he did stop sharing. He didn't overpromise there. I mean, it's like <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> so you know, th this is when you mistake epistemology for ontology, and then. Uh, <laughs> um, then uh, quickly jumping in here, uh, let's see, are there people in the queue? I see Robert's hand is up. Or is that an old hand, Robert? Yes, it was an old hand and it's not letting me take it down. Well, that didn't work. Sorry about that. <laughs> uh, thanks, uh, Robert. I appreciate uh, that note as well. Um, so, a quick takeaways, and we, you know, I'd like to hear comments about this. We have another, you know, twenty minutes or so before the break. Um, to me, one of the things that I think stood out in all of the presentations and all of the the five papers was, you know, the desire oh. to uh, to build consensus by diversity. Right? We need a diverse set of opinions to build consensus within the IETF. And that really means a diversity of opinions and, and there's a number of barriers to that and one of which is, can we even measure what's missing? Right? How do you measure? How do you, you can measure the diversity of what we have, but it's even harder to measure 
what we don't have. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of different types of, of diversity that we need to be able to look at, right? We need to be able to look at different cultures. We need to be able to look at different re genders, different regionality and different organizations. And uh, especially in some topics, there are particular uh, incumbents in in applications or something that are that are dominant over particular work within the IETF, for example, and how do we allow for a diverse set of opinions to be heard and allow everybody to have a voice in that discussion uh, when especially, um, I think, as, as one of the presentations discussed, um, you know, the existing long term IETFers might have the most uh, the most background and how do you hear the opinions of newcomers that might want to head in a different direction, for example, or spin a technology in a new way that's pushed back by by incumbents. So uh, looking for hands, Niels, I think you're first. Yeah, not having many, many, many answers here, but one way could be, and this also harkens back to the previous session, to compare IETF data to uh, uh, to other standards bodies. But then the thing is, are we, because you're comparing it to a different field, uh, you might not get exactly the same actors, but perhaps you could see how people interact and whether you see the same patterns uh, emerge. Subsequently, one could also see whether there are other modes of participation possible in the process and where that works. For instance, one could think of the work of Kai Jacobs that has done the work of integrating users in the, uh, in the standardization process. So those might, might be ways of thinking about it to not only just look at our data and our processes, I think, uh, to, to not stare ourselves blind at what we're doing and what are existing patterns and, uh, and modes of engagement. Lars? Yeah, so, um, I mean, not knowing what we don't know is hard, right? So, so knowing who we're missing without anybody participating that says, you know, hi, I'm the only one from this particular, you know, uh, group pre uh, presenting here, participating here because of A, B, and C, it's hard. But we, we know that we actually have underrepresented participants, like women or academics or, if you will, operators. Or So we actually know that we're deficient along certain um, dimensions already and sort of Pragmatically, right, um, I would like to sort of focus maybe in the short term on, on helping where we already know we have a deficit and, and we can certainly, you know, uh, discuss what else, where, where do we need to do some outreach or who do we need to bring in who isn't participating at all at the moment, which is a valuable goal. But we already have sort of identified issues that we can work on immediately, uh, which is a good thing, right? And we can compare ourselves to other organizations to some degree, but I think the ITF is also kind of its own special snowflake in some sense that that we have like, um, you know, people who basically, you know, joined as grad students and, and participate until they're like, you know, retired or, or even after, um, which I haven't seen anywhere else really, right? It's, it's really rare to have an organization where you have like decade long participants from the same individuals over very many different affiliations because they're like personally involved. But it's certainly, you know, it's not impossible to like compare ourselves to GDP or IEEE or somebody like that. Thanks. Uh, Mallory? Yeah, I mean, the question that you raised, Wes, um, you know, uh, I think to me, I just keep coming back to the larger question for me, which is diversity for what? And that's kind of why I think this application of looking at um, intersectional feminism is interesting because we tr we're trying to actually not just, we're not doing this as an exercise diversity for diversity's sake. Um, and I think that there's two things that implies um, when you ask diversity for what. Um, you know, one is uh, you sort of answered, right? We make better protocols. We have, you know, Comp diversity is competency is the sort of way you you put the first bucket of answers in. And then the second one, I think, is it actually forces us to do better work. So I think sometimes there's not a lot of participation from Africa, for example, because the things that we're working on in the IETF are not relevant to network operators in Africa. It's They don't see our work as interesting to them. And so it forces us to reassess, you know, are we actually working on interesting problems and maybe lack of participation indicates that what we're doing is just simply not interesting to people outside of us already. Uh, thank you. That's a good point, Mallory. Uh, Michael? 
Yeah, um, I wanted to make a point about the diversity of opinions because uh, when it, when it gets to that, then um, I think uh, it, it it needs to be well. We need to be able to identify threats of communication, and that was something that uh, we dealt with in this master thesis that I guided, where we were trying to get that. But I mean, I just wanted to point out that this is not trivial. You can have threats that merge. You have kind of multiple people answering. You know. Well, uh, if you structure it, it can be it can be a tree, but you can have multiple parents in the conversation. You can have things merging, splitting, and I think that needs to be a part of uh, identifying different viewpoints. So uh, that's something I'm I'm interested in. Has anybody has anybody looked at at threats at identifying an actual conversation? Uh, well, I will. I mean, I think that's a really. Sorry. Go ahead. I think that's a really exciting technical topic, actually, to be able to identify particular conversations that maybe are not going in a particular thread, but to be able to see if they move across uh, um, threads and who's involved in those conversations. Paul, uh, excellent, Paul. So I'm going to throw a topic at you too, uh, because you might be able to give us more background uh, in one particular aspect of trying to measure the opinions of people that aren't directly participating. ICANN, in particular, has a at-large community that tries to measure, you know, people that don't exist. I don't know if you can speak to that, Paul. You're you're part of ICANN, but that may not be anywhere near your realm. I'm in ICANN a lot, and I still don't know that community very well, so I can't speak to it. So thank you, Wes. Um, and no, I can't. Um, actually, even before I was at it, at, at ICANN, which I've been there six and a half years, I did try to look at that, especially in the at-large community, which would be one of the ones that is structured most like the IETF. That is, pretty much anyone can join. Very low entry to uh, barrier to entry and such like that. And um, uh, with working groups, you know, topic specific working groups. Um, one thing that we saw that we continue to see in the at-large community um, in ICANN, and I think we see this a lot in the IETF, and it's uh, I don't know how we can measure it, is um, people who feel like they're going to be interested to contribute, they start to contribute and for some reason drop out after one attempt, either going to one meeting uh, participating on one thread and such, and it would I would be fascinated to see if there's any research on what would be considered outliers because they only participate briefly, um, but to find out why they're only participating briefly. Certainly in the IETF, we have seen you know going to the question of uh, gender diversity. You know, uh, I'm not the only person who's heard from a woman at a meeting saying I'm not coming back. This sucks. Um, that doesn't prevent participation because there are mailing lists and such like that. But um, certainly in ICANN, where there's much better gender diversity and such like that, we still get people who will come in, start to work on something and go, you know what, this isn't what I thought. This isn't as interesting as I thought. And in a volunteer organization, you have to have something interesting for people to want to continue to volunteer. But there is really the question of people who st step in and then step away quickly. And I'd be, like I said, I'd be very interested in hearing any research on that or even methods that we could use to figure out what those people are thinking and possibly change the ways we do things to uh, make it more approachable and more interesting for them to continue longer. Yeah, that's a good point. And I think tailing on that is one thing that we haven't uh, really talked about uh, in, in in this slot yet, which is uh, the IETF is interesting because it's an open meeting where anybody can join, right? We've always said that there's no membership, uh, which is fantastic. Uh, I've actually heard complaints about ICANN that the only thing that you can join in ICANN is at large and any other group within ICANN requires that you have some other role even to get in the door and, and be part of those discussions. Um, but 
one interesting thing about ICANN is that they actually meet around the world and they force themselves to move to all the continents where the IETF doesn't do that. And the IETF has this chicken and an egg problem of we really only go to three continents a year and we've made an exception a couple of times where we've gone to Australia once and we've gone to, um, which is Oceania, and we've gone to um, South America once. And how can we measure those uh, We've never been to Africa, as far as I know. Uh, how how can we measure the the fact of whether or not they want to participate or not, or you know, um, the regionality? Do they only do they only participate locally, and does remote participation work? I mean, there's been a lot of discussion in the past two years of whether remote participation works. So, uh, anybody else have opinions? Uh, we still have ten minutes left. Uh, Yari. Yeah, I just wanted to make one observation. So, so obviously, diversity is hugely important, and, and we need to be able to uh, have a diverse discussion group in order to get good decisions, and not just along one axis, but multiple axes of diversity. But but it still feels a little bit like there's something missing because I, I think this is actually a sort of multi-level problem. We talked about that a little bit in the context of. Uh, or affiliation and Priyanka made this comment that it's it's it goes beyond affiliation. Affiliation. The same thing I I think applies to some extent to um, gender and location and and so forth. So you might actually find out that there are these interests that that people have or or their you know groups behind them or, or you belong to a, you know set of friends who believe in a particular way for some topic. Let's say you know what's your orientation towards data collection in the internet. And, and and those interest the diversity in those interests is, is is also hugely important. Of course, it's completely impossible to measure, but but I feel like it, it's not that we just get like representation from different uh, diversity groups and then we're done, because it, it, it it's it's only a proxy of some sort, and the, the real beef is is maybe maybe behind what you know people of a particular gender or people from a particular location or continent feel is the problem um but if, if you just mix people in in the wrong way you won't actually get it so i don't know what to do about it but just want to make this observation hi if i could have been uh, following on uh, on yari's point Please. Um, I mean, one of the things that we haven't spoken about, which obviously is really interesting and, and relevant, especially speaking to Paul's point about how do we measure who stays involved, right? And like what part of organizational culture are implicated in that. Um, I think in addition to the kind of, you know, data and analysis that, or the kind of analysis that can be done on the data that comes from the mailing list and that comes from sort of the um the stuff that we can see online is is part of that answer but i mean as an anthropologist i'm also somewhat biased to say that we also need to talk to people and we need to ask them and and this is the kind of work that both nick niels uh, and i have done for our respective phds and like specifically i looked at some of the um what i call the ihf's more rough working practices like it's focus on confrontation to get things done the general notion of abrasiveness being a good thing and I actually document how these all play a role in the fact that it is hard to get certain groups to stay within the IETF, right? Because it's often presented as this is a pipeline problem, right? Not enough women go into STEM fields, but there's also a different argument to make, which is plenty of people go into STEM fields. When they come to the IETF, they're just so uncomfortable that they rather go and work somewhere else when there are a lot of options for doing work elsewhere, right? Like the IETF. Obviously, I like, guess still a hugely important organization, but there are many other places where you can take your your STEM degree and, and have an interesting career that are perhaps not as uncomfortable to work in. Um, so that's just one of the things that I wanted to raise that in addition to the quantitative, more quantitatively oriented data and methods that we're discussing today, I think we also need to keep talking to people. Something you point out, Karina, is that uh, where we might be able to measure that people did drop off. Uh, we might be able to measure that there are these short term spikes of people, but we don't have the ground truth as to why. Um, so, certainly the ATF surveys that, you know, go out every single time are, are helpful in that regard, but we don't really have any data that allows us to mine, you know, why people aren't staying. Uh, we might be able to mine why people are staying if we send out new survey questions, but. That would be something possibly to work with with Jay on for future questions or the AESG as well. 
Uh, Yari, you have an old hand, I believe. Anybody else have uh, thoughts on this subject? I think it's uh, one of the more challenging ones of this uh, workshop and also <laughs> coincidentally one of the most important. Yeah, hi, Wes. Uh, just a quick Please. comment. Uh, I mean, definitely you cannot know why people leave or why people stay unless you actually ask them. And even if you ask them, the answer might not be the underlying truth. Yes. Uh, however, you can see, for example, whether people participate and their participation results in further engagement or, you know, I send an email to the mail list and uh, just get silenced by response. So there might be a small things like this that can help you to get some inference. And of course, it won't be on everybody, but since the mail lists are quite comprehensive and there is quite a few number of people, you might get a, an idea of what's going on. And in particular, if you correlate that with the occurrence of meetings, you might get a little bit extra also. You could get maybe participation of that particular people in the physical meetings. That might help uh, keep you a little bit of light on it. You know, you bring up, so you, you spurred a thought in my mind that I think that there has been past natural language processing work to identify emotions. And it may be that we could actually do, you know, feed all of the mailing lists in and identify the really emotional um, messages and see if, if some of the participants in that emotional stream suddenly just went away. Um, I've, I've certainly heard of cases where that has happened. So it'd be interesting to see, see if we could actually extract that out. Yes, I, I think uh, both from a text mining perspective of emotions and sentiment is as well as a simple time series analytics based on the a number of times somebody has participated like that temporal and both of them are uh, valid ways to do this. Right. And, and we need both sides of, of such a data mining, right? Not just the negative, but also the uh, the ones where they send a lot of heart emojis because they just really love the ATF, right? Those those should exist too. But... Right. Anybody else with opinions or questions? Things we're not considering. Groups we're not considering. That's that's the hard one, right? Who who are we missing? If not, maybe everybody's tired and we can go to so, break early too. But Mary? Yeah, I don't want to stop you from going to the break. So, but uh, I'm I'm recently talking more often to policymakers as well, and this is even harder because um, you know they don't have the time and the willingness to come and engage, but they still would like to have a bridge. They still would like to understand what's happening. So I think it's also not about participation only. If we talk about diversity, it's also how we get. Uh, other com communities formed and how we can keep a, a discussion or a communication going between other communities. But yeah, that and, probably would start a whole new discussion, which we don't have time for right now. <laughs> yes, but, but but in response to that, uh, Miria, and I don't want to want to want to reiterate my my previous point, but I'm going to do that anyhow. So it might be interesting to 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 then see because we know that there are other people and groups in ICANN, right? Um, to to simply see, not saying that it's a total comparison, but compare 3GPP, IETF, and ICANN and see who, who is present and who it then has impact and engages in the discussion in ways and how those um, networks play out and where they are uh, very different. So, and then, then we can hone in with more uh, qualitative or discursive methods to analyze where where the big changes are, or maybe see that it are the same six people in working groups all over uh, all over the bodies with largely the same corporations that uh, or the same dominant corporations in that sector that uh, uh, that actually make the decisions or not, right? Neil, just to jump in on on since you compared ICANN with IETF and 3GPP. I don't know how uh, 3GPP is staffed, but ICANN has literally over 50 full-time staff whose job it is is to, to get people to participate and keep them participating. The IETF has approximately zero. Um, and I deal with that staff a fair amount because I help on the technical end and such. And they spend a lot of time trying to convince people who aren't that interested in ICANN to keep coming and to keep participating. I don't think that that's a sustainable model for the IETF. I'm not sure it's sustainable for ICANN, um, but specifically, you know, Miria just mentioned uh, 
government and policy folks uh, and, and their interest in the IETF. Our, our, you know, policy support folks for the government, you know, keeping the government folks coming, literally fly around the world to convince three people from a country to keep coming and such. Um, it's not comparable at all. It, it really, the IETF is based on, are we doing interesting work, an, enough interesting work that people would come and volunteer? And I can, because we are trying to not become irrelevant and we have money to invest in not becoming irrelevant, spend money on trying to keep people interested. It, it's very different. I don't know where 3GPP is, but I suspect they're not as aggressive as even as I can is on, on that sort of thing. And other folks here certainly know much more about 3GPP. So I'll shut up here. No, you, you bring up good points, Paul. And so thank you for that. You know, um, if, if you have money to spend it becoming more diverse, you're likely to be more successful, certainly. And, um, you know, we do have the guides program in the ATF where we really do try and get people to come back, but we don't, you know, it's a very short term thing that spun up uh, right around convention time and doesn't often last long. I will close today with with one um, one of my earliest memories in the IETF um, uh, was was after I participated and did a few things and made some comments. Uh, somebody actually came up to me and said, I hope that you're going to stick around and I, I'd really like to see you as a working group chair or something like that. And really promoted me to, you know, to wanting me to, to continue. And I, I remember that. And even though it was probably 25 years ago or something, uh, that memory still sticks out in my head. I know the person that said it and because it really it incentivized me to go forward. Uh, Lars, I'll give you the closing shot, but we are actually into break at this point. Let's go break it. I was just basically going to reply to Paul, but um, okay. Well, that, I was going to close be, before we uh, uh, yes. uh, before before we uh, go to break, which will be thirty minutes. I propose that uh, we're going to merge the chat in uh, here and in Slack, so we don't have two streams of communication. So uh, people seem to most like Slack. So let's let's move the chat there. So you have thirty minutes to join that. If that doesn't work, just point it into the chat here if you need any support. And subsequently for the session that's not directly after the, uh, that's not directly after the uh, break, but the one thereafter where we'll be talking about the hackathon, we, uh, 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 we have made Uh, is he breaking everybody up for everybody else too? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> All right, Niels. Uh, I don't know if you can hear us, but uh, you, you, we lost you entirely. So. All right, let's go ahead and take a break and he can. Uh, uh, it actually, no one wanted to say, so maybe I can just go ahead Please. and say this. Um, so we have prepared a little um, Google Doc and I can put the link into the WebEx chat at this point still. Um, and uh, this is starting to organize the hacking groups. So um, I just randomly put some groups there based on the papers, based on the discussion and so on. But you are welcome to add additional groups if you think there's something missing that you would like to work on. Or you can even start um, signing up yourself to one of those groups. So have a look at the document, think about it, and we still have one more session to go before we talk about the hacking groups, but probably right point of time to look at this right now. Yeah, can I suggest you also and put it in, in the Slack too, please, uh, Miriam, yes. because uh, the, the WebEx chat may not last through people, so. Could you, after the break, Miriam, maybe say like one sentence for each of the topics, because some of them are not that sort of good. super clear. Like the first one, I don't know why this is an eight topic and not like a normal tools thing, but. Uh, so we have we have a whole session on that, right? So we have one more session where we talk about uh, um, decision making, I think, um, and then we have a whole session to organize ourselves into the in, into the uh, group. So um, you don't have to sign up right now, but you can think about already what where you would like to sign up, or you can add new topics, and then we can discuss it later. Thanks. All right, thank you, everybody. Uh, please have a wonderful twenty seven minutes.
Yeah, and we are still missing a few people. So let's wait for another 30 seconds or something. Yeah, call and start whenever you're ready. Yep, I'm just trying to figure out how to make Webex share my slides. Uh, you probably need, no, you don't have a share button at the bottom? You do, okay. I do, it's just taking a while to find the right file. There we are.
All right, can everybody see that? Yeah. All right, so uh, in that case, uh, welcome back everybody. Um, the goal of this session uh, is to, to sh shift the focus a little uh, and talk a bit about public opinions, processes and decision-making in, in the ITF in this session. Uh, now, we, we had um, seven submissions that fit into this category, uh, and I, I wanted to leave plenty of time for discussion in the session. Um, so, rather than have everyone try and uh, present their work, uh, what I did this time was I, I asked Michael Wessel and Ignacio Castro to uh, prepare a, a summary of, of what they saw as, as the key points of the various presentations. Uh, uh, and try and ask, ask some provocative questions uh, to get things started. Um, so, so we'll we'll start with that presentation, uh, and then once they're done, we'll we'll open the floor to the the offers of the uh, the other submissions. Uh, and if anyone wants to expand on their work or or to highlight aspects that have been missed in the summary, then uh, we, we we can do that. Uh, and then there should be plenty of time for for discussion of the the various open questions uh, uh, after that. Um, and um, if we can make this change slides, there we are. Uh, and uh, in terms of the, the questions we're, we're looking at in this session, uh, I think the, the focus here on this session is, is about how the ITF makes decisions, right? So, so we're talking about some of the, the technical decisions uh, about what goes into the, the content of the standards documents where, that, that we publish, uh, but also some of the, the procedural and, and process de decisions uh, and how we, sh we should um, you know, think about understanding and modeling and perhaps improving the standards process um, and about what makes uh, a successful RFC, how RFCs are used and referenced and so on. Uh, and what we can learn by by studying the various RFCs, drafts, and, and the email discussions. But shifting the focus perhaps from the, the people and, and the organizations to think about the decision-making process and the documents and, and how we learn about the documents. So with that, uh, I will switch over to um, the, the presentation from Ignacio and um, Michael, uh, and then uh, so, so I'll, I'll open the floor up after that. Uh, it's going to take a little while to load. Yeah, you want to go to the next slide, maybe? There. Is that working? Yeah. Yes. Okay. All right. There we go. Right. I think I'm the one giving the overview of the papers. Um, and I'll leave it to Ignacio to uh, provoke. <laughs> um, yeah, well, so this one, um, as it says here, it's about improving security considerations uh, by looking at various RFCs. Uh, the document had a discussion of these, well, what these two people have done, Matt and Mark. Um, you know, one of them has written a tool or uh, some some prior code, and one of them has written a draft that talks about how security considerations could be updated based on uh, text analysis. So this read to me like uh, them wanting to give an overview of what they're doing and inviting discussions, but uh, it sounded a bit like something that's already predetermined, pretty much. Um, I think I'll just go through them all. Is that, is that the plan? Yeah, so then next, please. The impact of, okay, so uh, very easy, the next being ours. This is just, uh, <clears throat> this is just raising a question. Um, we haven't done anything on that yet. Um, to see if it would be possible to better understand how we get from an ID to an RFC. Uh, as you would have seen, we've, at least I have just added myself to group five that's connected to, <laughs> to this. Um, just to better understand why, why would some ideas fail um, in case of resistance? You know, would it be that people are asking for more inputs? Are there real counter arguments? I mean, this was just raising possible questions in general. 
Um, our situation is that we've had long trouble of almost two years of, of hiring somebody on a position. COVID related trouble and all kinds of trouble, but it seems to now converge and uh, we're going to get somebody, but this is all uh, work that's in the future because of that. So um, we have had a master student creating an Apache Solar database out of uh, the email archives. I put a link before that um, to the chat. And that gave us some ideas, but all of that work, work would be NLP work uh, requiring, well, a, a bit more than what we probably can pull off quickly in the hackathon. So this is more of uh, future thoughts and all related to NLP. Characterizing the ITF through the lens of RSC deployment, well, uh, that's really your work. <laughs> um, what should I say about that? I mean, it's a pretty long paper given, giving a pretty detailed analysis. I found it very interesting to read, but I'm not sure what I should be saying about it here. Um, talks about trends in RFC production, factors of RFC success. Uh, maybe one thing worth pointing out for people here that they probably don't know if they haven't read the paper is that this paper points at another paper which has done a very long and thorough manual analysis of uh, success of RFCs, trying to understand which ones are deployed and not deployed and you know, uh, categorizing this as an online Excel sheet from that paper that, that documents all this effort. And uh, that was used as input for a part of this, of this particular paper here. So I think this is interesting for people to know about. And uh, there's a project in time series analysis. That's a different work um, that is just looking at the appearance of the words security and privacy and understanding how uh, this would have changed over time, applying time series analysis on that. And it also does the same on the word there, just uh, as, a, as a way of normalizing, because that, with the assumption that there would appear, well, as a function of how many emails there are and so forth. Um, that is using the Big Bang email archives. Uh, next. Tools for email analysis, uh, the challenges of, yeah, that cross document co-reference resolution in email, that looked to me like an NLP paper. Looking at an interesting topic in NLP, um, maybe a bit detached from what the other works here have been doing. Uh, just showing some progress on how, um, how well, I, there is this general problem of, of um, entity detection. I think if that's in the right name for it, uh, see, yeah, co-reference resolution. I mean, just an understanding whether whether there is an entity identified. You know, if multiple sentences refer to the same, for instance, to Barack Obama, that's a common example here. <laughs> uh just out of the context of the sentences and this gets a bit i mean this is traditionally done on news text and uh there has been some prior work also that looked at emails usually there's this enron email corpus that has been used for things and um, that of course complicates matters because you may want to be able to identify these entities even when they appear somehow or references to these entities appear in different emails and uh, so this is just a paper that makes some more progress uh, on that topic of uh, identifying entities cross emails. Um, my understanding is what well, was that this was only done on the on the Enron email corpus, which is a standard email body uh, in NLP, but hasn't yet been applied to the IETF. So that's the relevance here. It's good input, right, for people wanting to do NLP on the email archives of the IETF. And then the document called Research Proposal, right, that describes prior work on uh, from IoT <laughs> uh, using, uh, I think it was a master thesis that worked on the 1M2M group and uh, applied network analysis and uh, found alignment of stakeholders. So the idea would be a bit connected to what some of the things we've been discussing here that uh, forming camps of companies, you know, uh, there are, for instance, certain groups of companies that always work together or something like that. And uh, the idea here yeah, that is being raised is whether this could be extended to, um, to the IETF. So that is just described as a future idea using uh, group meeting minutes and attendee lists, mail archives. And that all seems to be focused on IoT groups only.
that's probably the, the topic of the PhD thesis. This may be about, I don't know, I'm speaking on behalf of others here. But I'll just go through it all and then now <laughs> the authors, I guess, they will have opinions about what I said. So next, please. Um, okay. Um, the first one here describes, it's just a description of the upcoming PhD thesis that, I, that we're going to advise when that person is in place. Uh, in fact, today I have sent an email to somebody saying that we, we can offer you the job. It's been a long process with many, many administrative hurdles. So uh, if everything goes well in a few months, we're going to have somebody, but it's just a futuristic, I mean, it's what, what we want to do. This is about education. So the idea here will be that uh, by applying NLP on emails, uh, we might be able to get better educational source material to be able to understand why certain decisions have been made. That's uh, really NLP. Not so much about the procedure, more about the content. And then there's RFCs change. Uh, that was also quite interesting. This talks about a tool that uh, Paul Hoffman has written that is at this URL. And uh, the point of that tool is to, well, essentially, if you look at an RFC, then the RFC header is going to tell you that this obsoletes other RFCs or updates other RFCs, or at least the data tracker does tell, tells you that. But it's not so easy to figure out which uh, future drafts or drafts that are out there already uh, would, for instance, obsolete this RFC or are in some way related to this RFC. So there could be a structure of some internet drafts trying to update this RFC, another internet draft going to obsolete this RFC and so forth. And uh, this is a tool that tries to collect all that data together. And this document also says that ICANN is in the early stages of uh, extending this. Uh, making it making it richer, incorporating errata, mail discussions, and so forth. And uh, so that is the idea to add more information to that existing tool. Next. Okay, I can hand over to Ignacio. I've finished my difficult task of speaking on behalf of others. <laughs> Uh, I mean, and and thank thank you for for summarising. Uh, so, so before Ignacio jumps in, do, do any of the the authors of the other presentations want want to jump in at this point? Uh, any the other the other submissions? Yeah, my apologies if I misrepresented somebody. Uh, I, I thought it was a, a really nice summary. Paul, jump jump in whenever you you want. It's a very quick note because the tools I'm talking about here I don't think are as relevant to the workshop as some of the others. Um, the second tool that I discussed uh, is actually is, is I'm sorry. The second topic that I discussed is will be a separate tool. So the CLI tool already exists. Uh, many folks here use it. The second tool is actually going to be uh, completely new. Where uh, basically, if you are looking at an RFC through this tool, you will see the information such as errata, email discussions, and such like that. It'll be basically an annotated view of RFCs. So nothing like the, the current IETF CLI tool um, and work on that is, has not yet started, but will be soon. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Anyone else want to jump in? All right. In that case, let's make this here to be provocative. Maybe then very briefly talk one sec uh, about uh, our contribution. So that paper, uh, which we have posted in Slack, is a part of a, a larger project. Where we are trying to understand uh, the ITF and its decision making. So the paper is just a, a teaser of what we are doing in the project. And if you don't mind calling, I'm going to try to share my screen because I think that uh, maybe I sent uh, the wrong version of the slides and I have more recent one. Uh, okay. Uh, yes, I can drop this on to you. Okay, you already figured out how to share. You're way ahead of me. Ah. Magic. I don't know if I will. Okay. Yeah, uh, I, uh, that was, that was my next slide. Yes. So, well, thank you, Michael, for that summary. Uh, Stephen, from that summary, we were thinking what are the overarching topics and uh, from what we could see, well, one of them is uh, well, what are the questions that we are trying to answer? And some of those questions seem to map in uh, success versus failure. Uh, what is a good uh, 
RFC or a successful RFC, maybe it's not the same thing. Uh, and what makes the process of RFC making successful or better? Uh, with regards to the decision making, which is not necessarily the same as uh, an RFC itself, uh, what are the bottlenecks? How can we improve in the process of the decision making in order to create those RFCs? Uh, who supports what? Which people, which institution is supporting a particular technology, a particular draft? Uh, also, when is a decision made? Can we infer maybe from the videos, maybe from the mails? Uh, when different people have arrived to a decision that uh, gets translated into a, uh, into a change in, uh, in the draft or to the final publication or the adoption of it. Uh, and also, what, what is the decision that has been made? And related to this is uh, where can we find these answers? And I think that most of us has uh, looked pretty much at the mails, probably because that's uh, one of the most greatly sources of information and one of those sources that uh, we can more easily tackle. However, there are also RFCs with uh, the drafts and all the versions of the drafts that can be tackled. Uh, there are also meeting minutes, uh, also the meeting audio and video, uh, information in the Git repositories. And of course, this information is not as easy to access as the email, might require much more preprocessing or might be less representative of all the groups. Like for example, some groups are heavily using Git, but not all of them are. Uh, using information from the meeting on the, uh, in terms of audio and video might be quite rich, but of course, processing it uh, is uh, a work in itself. And there's also interesting external data that uh, again, is also sometimes complicated to handle but uh, or obtain, but once we obtain it, we could all benefit from it as a community. And this could be, Printing from surveys, like for example, we're planning to make a survey uh, to understand better adoption of RFCs. This was a problem that we had in our paper. Uh, we wanted to measure, to have some metric of, let's say, quality of RFCs or relevance of RFCs, and we realized that, uh, well, how do you define that? Uh, we can also do manual labeling, like for example, we plan to do that uh, for decision making, get a manual label, a pe a people to manually label when a decision has been made might be useful also for uh, understanding which is the entity that uh, is being referred inside of the mails, uh, which was also mentioned in, uh, by one of the works in this uh, thread. Uh, but there might be also others, uh, like for example, uh, data on patents, uh, data on citations, which might be quite relevant. And of course, one of the things that uh, I think that we are all converging here is uh, how can we manage to extract that information? So. This is my teaser more than a provocation, and hopefully people who have submitted here or somewhere else can correct us in the summary that we have made or on what are the questions, the answers, and how to tackle them. And over to you, Colin, and to the floor. Okay. Thank you, Ignacio. Thank you, Michael. I think that, that was a really nice summary. Uh, some really nice questions. Um, does anyone... Uh, have questions to start with or, or comments they want to jump in with. Uh, certainly, while we're waiting for people to join, I, I thought that was that last point was a really interesting one about the, the limits of what we can measure in terms of deployment and so on. Uh, and, you know, we, we, we can measure what, what the IETF does, but once something is, is finished, whether it gets used or not, is uh, a really difficult challenge to understand. But, uh, do, do you have thoughts on how to go on that and how to extend the data from, from the, the publication process to what happens next? Uh, so, for example, with regards to relevance or implementation to a particular RFC or technology, yeah, that's a very good question. Yeah. It's, um, that's uh, something very hard to to tackle. Uh, first of all, what is uh, a good RFC or what is implementation? Um, can you compare implementation of different things? Like uh, something might be implemented uh, across uh, the whole layer and something uh, something else might be constrained to a particular niche where it might be part, uh, might be very relevant. So it's very difficult to compare. Uh, where to get that, uh, that data? Uh, 
I'm not quite sure. I mean, uh, one thing that uh, you can do is uh, we can you can use that uh, data set from uh, the paper that we mentioned in ours, where they did some manual labeling. Maybe you can look for whether a particular draft or FC is uh, mentioned in uh, Nanoc or other network operator lists. Though, of course, that does not necessarily mean that it's implemented. It just means that it's being discussed. Whether there are articles in Wikipedia about it, uh, though, again, uh, you have to take that with a pinch of salt because it might mean many different things. But it probably means to some extent that uh, it has gone beyond the remit of the ITF and it's, uh, more, uh, it's in a different level of discussion beyond the standardization itself. Yeah. Okay. Good. Okay. And ha have you thought about mapping it to actual code implementations and then using the download statistics from packet managers, for instance, in uh, uh, to measure implementation? Yeah, that's a really cool idea. I guess that they, I mean, I, I can. I guess that you could do part of uh, trying to map uh, uh, different implementations to each other based on similarity. Of the code, I guess that what would be difficult is to find, a, say, for a particular implementation or of a given protocol, how to map one to the other. So, an implementation of a quick, let's say, like maybe it's well described in the GitHub, but maybe it's not so clear. So, but it's a really good idea. I guess that uh, you could do a extensive exercise collecting code from many different places for those that you can automatically label uh, or map to a given uh, protocol or FC, see which Did other code is similar enough to that to assume that is the same. Yeah, especially if it makes it into Debian, for instance, then you can use popularity contest to, uh, to measure implementation there. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, Paul, Paul Gruff, do you have your hand up? Yeah, uh, so I just wanted to kind of follow up on this point because we, we're kind of very interested in this data set because we think the, the natural language is quite complicated. And one of the questions I had when hearing this discussion is how good or how accurate do we need the extractions to be to start making conclusions? And that's something that I, I've been kind of listening and trying to understand a little bit through the course of our conversation is like to what level of quality do we need to be able to kind of identify uh, things in, in emails, but in general, do uh, analytics on this data set? Well, I'm not an NLP expert, but uh, but I work with some NLP experts, so I hope that by osmosis, I have uh, gained some knowledge uh, from what they uh, from what they think. Uh, I would guess that the, the one of the problems that you have is that the, you frequently need to have some label data. So when you make those inferences, you know that if I have this piece of data and I have it labeled as talking about X or referring about a particular entity, when I apply NLP algorithm X, when it's beyond this level, it's a pretty good inference that uh, this is actually the case. And frequently the problem is that uh, we just don't have that uh, label data. Not sure yeah, I mean, I, yeah, the the kind of, this is the kind of problems that we're trying to work on, but uh, it, my my main question is like, okay, do we need to per approach the precision of, uh, you know, uh, you know, state of the art models in that place or can, how, how, how bad can we be on a, to figure out in order to make, to order make conclusions that are useful? Yeah, I, to be honest, I don't have a, I don't have a perfect answer for that. I guess that uh, at the very least, uh, you can observe trends. So you might not know whether the mapping is precise enough to know whether you can categorically say uh, one thing or the other, but you can see that there is a trend and that might be helpful enough in shedding some light into the particular question that you are trying to answer. Yeah, uh, are there things we can do in the ITF to help with the labeling? Uh, or is this just a, 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 a hard NLP problem? Well, um, again, without being an NLP expert, sorry, Paul, you were going to say something. 
I, I think it's clear that the the more labeled data we get, the the nicer it is, right? Uh, for for us to do our job. But I also think like one of the actually interesting, from a very just NLP perspective, from uh, a technical perspective, one of the very interesting thing about this domain is that you have a lot of change, and it's very long tail, right? So that's why it's kind of exciting about. IETF data is the fact that it's very messy and very long tail, and it's not like uh, what you see in other domains. So in some sense, annotated data is great if you're going to have actual answers to, to problems, but from a kind of LP perspective, it's kind of fun to work on domains that are actually super hard, which I think IETF data is. Yes, as an NLP expert, I have uh, analyzed the Linux kernel mailing list, which is even worse because you have patches, uh, code patches in messages. So that's actually much harder. <clears throat> the ITF data uh, mailing list messages are probably better in that sense in that a lot of the uh, text is, is user generated, human generated. Uh, the challenges are in the fact that there is domain specific words like the names of the protocols, other things which normally, even by using uh, large language models like BERT, et cetera, uh, the fine tuning may be better if you have a knowledge base, which might be something that ITF might want to construct. Yeah, Stuart, one of the very cool things of the ITF is that uh, you have many layers of data. so. You can see the conversation in the mail list, and uh, then you can see that uh, maybe a change uh, has happened in the draft. So, ideally, you can map uh, that conversation in the change uh, in the draft. So, that's something very, very cool about the ITF. And I guess that uh, any additional layer of this type of data that can be provided is super helpful. So, for example, uh, those uh, blue sheets uh, with participation in the live meetings, if they were to be uh, not a PDF that is hard to scan and it could be like in a standard format or something like this, probably that would be very helpful because sometimes what happens is that they, instead of addressing the cool question, you spend half of the time just trying to gather the preliminary data source. Yeah, it's very, sorry to... Be another thing similar to that, like... Uh, uh, at the moment, we have affiliations of draft uh, authors, but they frequently is just in the draft, so you need to manually parse it from the text. So if that was in the data tracker, I don't know, I think that recently it is. That's very helpful. And uh, the affiliation of uh, the people attending the meeting that appears in the blue sheet, if that was in the data tracker too, that would be also quite helpful for all the people that have been talking before about the interesting things that stem from affiliation. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Paul Hoffman, uh, do you have your hand up? I do I? I didn't want to sidetrack the uh, the research subject, but um, Colin had asked earlier, or or had indicated that part of where this was going was, or one one direction where this was going is, um, can we determine success? Uh, can we use this data to determine success of? Um, the IETF process, you know, after an RRC is published and such. And um, in a previous life of mine, when when I ran the uh, VPN consortium, which was basically consortium of IPsec developers, we really tackled this hard because there's sort of three different ideas. There is, you know, once an RFC is published, um, if that feature is offered at all, which usually only appears in configuration. Um, if you're lucky, it appears in marketing materials, but often it only appears in, in configuration, which as we all know is not standardized. Then if that is actually even tries to be conformant with the RFC, um, some of us are familiar where an RFC is published, but a bunch of developers think that it's wrong. So they'll actually implement something close, but not actually it because they didn't like the way the RFC came out. Um, and then interoperability, which is, I think, what many of us are really hoping for. Um, I 
going back to a discussion from earlier today where there are things like um, Lars put up the uh, quick um, features chart, you know, uh, who, who has implemented various features. That kind of thing, I think, would be fairly good to uh, include in research um, is to see to, to look at how widespread a feature is at least implemented. Um, it's not sufficient, though, and again, going back to um, the old days of my old days of IPsec, there were RFCs that were published that were explicitly only for about three developers. That is, the other other folks were not interested in doing this. They didn't want to stop it from being done, but they pulled out of the discussion because it was an extension to, in these cases, most cases were for uh, Ike V2. They were extensions that they didn't want to offer to their their customers. They didn't they didn't see the purpose to it. So that wouldn't a low adoption would not indicate a failure if it was in fact adopted by the folks who had participated in the working group discussion uh, or the, I'm sorry, the developers, especially who had participated in the work group discussion. So I don't know, I, I, I again, I, I said earlier, I would like to see some way of the IETF or at least, you know, either formally or informally corralling those uh, those feature charts, uh, especially the ones that are kept up to date, as as a tool for researchers to look at um, success um, for some of the things. Um, and just this morning, actually, um, Eric uh, Vinke, who's on on the call, noted that even when um, a thing is has an RFC and basically nobody implements. We still will keep it around in our heads uh, in, in the specific case that came to mind this morning was um, uh, DNS over TLS, but actually DNS over DTLS. It got a port number. We're not going to unassign the port number, even though there are no known implementations after years. A measurement there would have been probably helpful for the IESG to decide whether to do something as trivial as to as to give its port numbers to someone else. So I, I don't know if if this would come from the IETF or with researchers trying to pull it, but please do consider this. I'm very interested in how widely features are implemented. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I think it was mentioned earlier, and as you say about the, the the IAB has the EDM program that's looking at some of these topics, but uh, it's it's a very difficult problem and just seeing how things go from from the ITF into the broader community. Okay. Um, okay, I see hands also from Michael and then from Justice. Yeah, I just want to answer on that on that thing with feature charts. Um, I mentioned before that there is this online Excel sheet that some people have constructed and I have, I mean, having looked at it, I have seen that they have specifically looked at feature charts as one of the inputs to decide that this has been deployed. So this is maybe interesting. What, what I can do is I can dig it up from the paper because actually paper from Colin and Ignacio and all these others <clears throat> that has made me look at the other paper as well. And that has the link to uh, this Excel sheet. So I'll, I'll dig it up and send it to the Slack. It's really interesting. Okay, Justice. Yeah, regarding this discussion about measuring implementation, success, failure of RFCs. Um, so it, it seems that like there is an ambitious and difficult way of doing it. It's, it's actually trying to measure what's done in implementations. And then there might be a cheaper way. And then like it's, I would be curious about whether there's any value in that. What you have thoughts about it this is basically looking at bibliometric indications like citations to the RFC from scientific literature references from other RFCs or from non IATF standards. Non patent literature prior art citations from new patent applications. So they are all obviously very different in nature, but like it's if you correlate these and you see that. Along all these different dimensions, some RFCs like really stand out and others don't. Like it's that probably gives you an indication of impact, right? I mean, like it's a 
and and that 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 seems to be data that is systematically available for all RFCs and uh, is less context dependent and probably easier to collect. Yeah, yeah. I, I mean that, that's certainly a, a good point. Uh, so, sorry, uh, I mean the, the the other point I think is is that uh, if if you see uh, people working on extensions to an RFC in the ITF, it's at least a sign that there's some interest in in that original RFC. So we we can infer some of it, uh, Ignacio. I'd, let me just quickly add this. I just put a link to an um, RFC that was published on the uh, independent submission stream where um, an IB member did some initial analysis about references. So this was definitely something that was discussed, but it's also a lot of work. And that person just looked at like a small sample set. Uh, if, if we get more data, that would definitely be interesting. Yeah. So, sorry for interrupting. I'm not being polite. I'm just trying to figure out how to raise my hand. Um, <laughs> Okay, go ahead. Yeah, this, this is not the most obvious system. <laughs> uh, but this is uh, you were uh, you were spot on. So we have actually uh, look at all those features to try to predict the. Uh, so in the previous paper and another one that we have now under submission, we have tried to predict the uh, deployment, uh, publication of a draft, uh, an adoption of a draft by a given working group, and indeed we have uh, used some of uh, some of the metrics that you were saying, in particular citations. Um, we haven't used patents uh, just because it's a bit more complicated and we would have first to crawl uh, the database of patents to identify patents that are related or to the belong to the affiliation of the authors or are done by those authors that participate in a given draft. But that's a really good point. The, there is some work though from uh, the economist, uh, uh, from uh, economics uh, trying to see the impact of uh, patents on uh, Supporting or not particular drafts uh, in the ITF. All right. Um, so, so we've we've obviously said a lot about uh, documents uh, uh, and outcomes and so on. Um, one of the other focuses in this session was about the decision making. Um, are there any things which make it? especially hard to model the type of decisions that, that the ITF is making. Uh, you know, what, what are the challenges in, in this space? And, and what types of decisions are people interested in modeling? I want to jump in on this one. Sure, Ignacio has opinions, but are other people looking at decisions? Ignacio, I'm sure you've got opinions on decision making. Yeah, I might have some. Yeah, well, I guess that uh, it's quite useful when the ITF has very standard uh, comments uh, through the mail list, like, uh, does people support this RFC? So we publish it, uh, so we adopt it, because of course that makes easy to parse uh, the process of the decision making. So anything on that line is, uh, is quite helpful. Uh, I guess that the main decisions that uh, at least from my side uh, are particularly interesting in is uh, um, whether a, a draft is adopted uh, by a given working group, uh, whether people agree or disagree on particular technical features, and whether people want further explanations on them. At least those are the most obvious ones uh, that come to mind. So I would be also curious to hear from uh, the side of uh, the people from the ITF, what are the problems that they see in the decision making? What are the aspects where maybe more light is needed or more help is needed? I know Colin, you have mentioned sometimes a, a cursory review. So maybe these are also things where people from uh, this side of uh, the arena can help with. Yeah, I think that's a good question. Um, do, do people who, who are perhaps more involved in the day-to-day -day ITF have opinions on what would be useful to measure? So I will ask for something very hard. I mean, it's easy to, to look 
well, it is easier to look at um, the kind of concrete artifacts that you mentioned when somebody makes a call for adoption or something, you know, gets a, uh, a publication request or something, a, a, a concrete review comes in through the review tool. Those are, are, are good, easy ways to see at least what point in time a, a decision is being made. Um, I would like to see if there is a way to algorithmically watching the artifacts produced on mailing lists or even in the data tracker, um, identify when a group's thinking about a direction has a, a, a achieved a cohesive direction, even if it's not a decision for the what the, the final protocol is going to look like. But um, to to identify that point where um, uh, a group of people have made the decision to start working together in a particular direction instead of just poking at the blob to see, you know, how the blob wiggles. Yeah, with my ISG yeah. hat on, right? so, so some of the things that that I think would be useful for the ISG. So one thing that we sort of anecdotally hear a lot is that you know the ITF is slow. That was also from the survey. Lots of people seem to believe that the standards process is taking a long time. Um, and a few years ago or many years ago, um, we could sort of confidently more or less point to the RFC editor and say they're slow. But that's not no longer the case. They're actually quite fast. Um, the, the, on the RFC editor side, the slowest thing I think that we're seeing is the authors responding during Auth48, um, so, which is good. But on the IETF side, it's, it's much less clear sometimes where the delays are. Right, and some of that might be, be that the data tracker doesn't necessarily make it very clear who holds an action item for a certain document. For example, is it with the chair? Is it with the author? Is it with the area director? Um, and even attributing that is sort of difficult. So it's it's so. For example, we had a proposal um, where somebody said, "What if we like uh, ran all the last calls in parallel? Right? Ran the working group last call in parallel with the IETF last call, and already have the area directors review the document." Surely this must speed things up, right? And yeah, you want to believe that, and for some documents it may, but it's not clear that it will actually help much overall because maybe the delays are with the working group most of the time. And so we don't really have a good insight where sort of time gets lost. Um, some groups seem to be very clocked by the meetings three times a year, and you see like three updates, pretty much, you know, very evenly spaced. Other groups are completely different, and we don't really know um, how many of the former groups versus the latter groups we have, or if there's other patterns. Sort of, sort of insight into how can we sort of streamline the process so that the, the community can work better and faster, I think would be helpful to the ISG. Yeah, I think that that was a very good point, like who has the action item, uh, because I guess that, well, I see it myself in any email communications very often is not clear. I was wondering if uh, from your point of view, uh, the decision making and the clarity on who has the action item uh, it has improved for those groups uh, relying on Git. I'm not sure. Well, it, it depends on how the groups use Git. So, I, I mean, I, I shared quick and it, that was used pretty heavily, but um, and, and so th it was very clear in the working group phase who had an action item because we were very actively pushing issues and labeling that and had like a, a project board and all that. I don't know if all groups are doing that. Um, and then we at the moment have this big break where when we move from Git to the you know, ITF last call stage and beyond where um, Git isn't really useful anymore or it's a lot of work on the chairs and the authors to pull email back into the issue tracker. Um, so I don't know if Git, it might help, but I think the working groups that see a use for Git are sort of pretty actively tracking things anyway, because that's why they use Git. I don't know if Git really helps for casual groups so much. So for TCBM, for example, which is maybe a bit slower than other groups, um, I, I sort of use Git for, for my documents, but it doesn't really seem to speed anybody else up. Um, so <laughs> there's that. Follow up directly on that question. The IESG recently asked to have an action holder explicitly added to the data tracker. Has that turned out to be um, illuminating? Is it there yet? Yeah, it's been there for um, so, 
a couple of months, I believe, it's for the ISG well, phase. When it's, but it's that this is only there for the ISG stage or the, or the right. just the ISG stage. Yeah. Um, I don't. I think it needs to show up in more places or something. Right. I don't think it's visible enough that it really sort of seems to have made a big difference yet. But yeah. But I mean, one thing is sort of improvements to the data tracker, right? But then there's also simply looking at the data we have and trying to figure out, you know, what limited the speed at which a given document or a given technology went through the standards process. And it might well be that the answers are different, but maybe one thing is very controversial, like a spring, for example, or groups like that, right, which we have just very heavy debates. Maybe some are slow because the groups are just clocked by the meetings. Maybe it's something else, right? That would be good to understand. You're brainstorming the, the the sources of those. I added one to the to the Slack. Sometimes it's um, blocking on external um, requirements. That's true as well. Yeah. So so I don't want to cut off the the discussion, but I'm conscious that we're we're sort of running uh, out of time here. Um, so uh, anyway, we we we've had a lot of talk about a particular focus uh, and obviously there were a broader range of, of submissions into this session and I, I think we've pr probably touched on at least most of them. Uh, is, is there anything that, that the, the authors of the submissions um, which perhaps been le less um, sort of discussed want to bring up very quickly before we finish? Do, do, do jump in if there is and uh, if not um, I guess we're done. All right, in that case, I guess it's over to you, Maria. Yes, and now I also unmuted myself. Um, I guess you only see like my slides in a very tiny window, so maybe this is a little bit better. Yes. Okay. Um, okay. So um, this is this is the part where which uh, I mentioned already previously. Um, we now uh, had a lot of discussion, and um, I identified a lot of uh, questions from the papers we got submitted, but also from the recent discussions. I made some notes, but I didn't update these slides. Um, and I think we should tackle, try to tackle some of these questions in the next couple of days and then meet on Thursday again and see uh, if we could reach anything or if we have just more questions, which, which might also be a valid outcome. Um, before we actually try to think about how to organize ourselves in, in groups and what are the most important questions, I do have a few slides here um, and I will quickly run through them. Um, uh, I, I will be quite quick, so if you want to look at the details go to the GitHub and look at the slides yourself and read all the questions in detail. Um, because what I did here is really look at all the position papers and really look for what are the questions in the position papers and copy them into slides, basically. And a lot of these questions you will find on these slides are really kind of a one-to-one -one copy from the paper because they were phrased like as questions in the, in the papers. Um, sometimes I did a little bit of wording changes, but not much. So before we start on the questions, this is also just a very quick summary about um, tools and data, what I found in the in the in the papers. So most of the papers really looked at mailing list archive, the RFC index, a lot of data is available over the data tracker and we got a nice introduction from uh, Robert. Um, but I also want to point out that there's even more data on the IETF.org page. Um, there is um, more information about meeting participation. There are um, these data that Greg presented about the page itself, like who is looking at the page uh, and these kind of things. And there's also things like survey data that we collect about the ITF. Um, just in the previous session, GitHub was mentioned. We might be able to get some metadata from the video conferencing tools we're using and so on. So there might even be more data than we think about, should think about that. Um, yes, there's also a bunch of tools we talked about today, which already go ahead and analyze the data and try to provide some of this data. So there were even more tools mentioned in the papers we got, um, and this is for your reference. And then when talking about tools, there were not so many open questions, but there were a few. Um, so um, uh, Yari, for example, submitted a position paper where he asked about like, um, what are the metadata information that the RSS are interested that are participating in the ITF or what are the co companies interested in the, in the, who are participating in the ITF? 
and this is also what he provides in his own statistic papers about the geographical split, the gender distribution, and so on. And um, so this is all meant to be kind of data for people um, participating in the ITF and learning about <laughs> what's going on. And then there was a paper from Hoffman that we also just briefly discussed in the previous session, um, who was also asking what are the relevant metadata that could we could provide together with the RFC that is interesting for RFC authors, but also for RFC readers, I guess. Okay, um, so let's move on to uh, questions about participation trends. We had like a whole lot of um, submissions about diversity and inclusivity talking about the international footprint, talking about um, gender a lot, uh, general diversity questions, uh, inclusion, um, fairness, transparency as well. Um, so all these things are mentioned. So this could be probably a group of people who might be interested to connect each other and, and work together. So we can keep this in mind for a hacking group potentially. Um, then we had another whole bunch of papers which were connected to the question about affiliation and industry control. So like how people change affiliation, we discussed this earlier today, um, and and what what is their company interest, what's their own interest, how to separate this, um, and how does it impact the work in the IETF, basically. Um, and then the last session we, we discussed about this decision making and process aspects. Um, and there was also quite interesting to see in the paper that there were many different uh, methods about how to do content analysis, basically, because that's a big challenge here, looking at keywords, um, looking at mailing list content, looking at metadata as well to understand how a document evolves, um, looking at volume analysis over time, um, and looking at correlation between different um, development. Um, so there was like a whole lot of methodology, which might also be interesting to just discuss in a, in a hacking group. Um, but then there were again like a whole bunch of um, open questions on the methodology as well, right? What are the next keywords to analyze? What are the challenges for these methods? And how can we use the outcomes of this to actually improve the work in the IETF? And then there was this this other um, batch, which was not only about the um, the methodology, but also about like really understanding the process. What is the decision making process? How can it? How can you be successful in the IETF? What do you have to do to bring your draft to an IETF, uh, to an RFC? Uh, and what can, what do you have to do to actually write a pr successful protocol that also gets deployed? Um, so this was another set of questions, which might be a different hacking group. And finally, something that we didn't discuss about today at all, we had like two more papers that talked about um, sustainability. So one paper was really looking about, you know, what's the ITF's role in the climate change? How is also the technology impacting um, climate change in a negative or positive sense that we develop? And the other paper asked the question about how does the CO2 footprint of ITF meetings evolve? And is it, you know, is it better to move all online? Is it better to meet? Like, what's what's the right thing here looking at? Um, at global warming and, and CO2 footprint. So these are topics that we didn't have today, but we will have time for these topics on Thursday. The, the day was already crowded today, so we took this out, but um, these were very early papers, more asking questions than presenting results. So we actually hope this, that these papers and other interesting interested people can work together and maybe even present some results on Thursday. That would be really great. And then before um, I open the discussion, I would like to take the op opportunity to also add a little bit more things here, um, because um, I'm also a member of the IHG, and um, you might have seen um, this data at an IETF plenary. So this is a little bit of data that the IHG is looking like, and actually I go to the next slide because this is a more updated version of the same data. Um, and what we look at um, is, for example, the total number of mails sent the number of ITF draft published, and then particularly interesting is the one um, at the at the right bottom, which is the number of zero zero drafts published. So the new work coming to the ITF basically. And when we look at the curve of last year, the yellow curve here, and the the curve of this year, the green curve here, we actually see quite a difference to the previous years. So it does look like that the situation we're in right now does have an impact on productivity or at least an impact on like getting new ideas into the IETF. And we have this little data here and there is a strong um, uh, hint here that there might be something, but it's really not enough to understand what's going on and how big the impact is. Um, I'm also an author about a document that talks about um, organization of online meetings. 
And I just realized by writing this, this draft that there are so many questions where I could need some answers um, about online meetings. How did really moving to this fully online setup impact productivity? That's like, you know, what I talked about at the previous slides. But also, how did it really change? change how does um, this change from fully online change how we work maybe we use more interims does it make us more productive or less productive does it have an impact on cross area interaction does it have an impact on inclusivity um does it have an impact on participation in general like how does it change do we have more newcomers and um, do they actually become active participants are people less active are people speaking up less often um, how many sessions do they visit um, you know, is, is the week uh, as crowded as it was before or are people visiting ITF meetings more selectively? All these kind of questions, I don't have answers, but I think we have the data for it. Um, and there's a whole bunch about socializing, which we know there's a problem, but we also don't know how to solve it. But maybe there's also some data about how we use Gather and other tools and whatever. So that's just something I wanted to add here. Um, and with that, we will actually go, I will stop sharing because I can't see anything else. <laughs> so, um, but we will go to this Google document. Um, and I already started putting some groups there, um, but this might not be the right groups. It's just like what came to my mind from these slides. The idea is that we organize ourselves into smaller groups. This could be like two or three people who are really interested in one specific topic, or it could be a little bit larger group of whatever, seven, eight people. Um, who all work on the same um, area of, of questions. Um, and then these groups can organize themselves freely based on the time zones they're in. You don't have to stick to the workshop time zone. You can also find other slots to, uh, tomorrow and the day after tomorrow that fits well to your group. Um, and you can organize yourself freely. You can use Slack, you can use Gather, um, you can use any conferencing tool you, you want. If you need support with the conferencing tool, we can also give you a WebEx session. Just let us know. Um, but we also have these Sunga WebEx sessions tomorrow and on uh, Wednesday, where just like uh, all the chairs will be there and like everybody can join and we can either just chat or if there are any problems or any questions, then please feel, feel free to approach us there. So um, this is the plan for the next two days. And then hopefully on Thursday, we can discuss some of the result results or just more questions or whatever. We will see what comes out of this. OK, let me um, stop sharing. Um, if I find the right button here. And then let me see if there are already any questions here. I hope. You have seen my screen because now I'm still seeing somebody else sharing. Yes, we yeah, have seen your screen. Uh, I, I don't know how to make it go away. <laughs> it's really weird. You could do it like Wes did when, and just totally log off. Uh, I, I did. <laughs> you did. I, I quit and rejoined, and it's still sharing now. Ah, uh, because I think there are more people still sharing. sharing here. Let me see if that works. Okay, now, right? <laughs> All right. Okay. Um. Yeah. So I will just ask everybody to look um on your own into this Google Doc. I won't share it um, so we can see each other faces and actually talk to each other. Do you, do you want to say maybe a little bit more about what you expect to be the topics for each of the groups? Yeah, I was hoping um, that was kind of matching to, you know, what I had in the slides. And now if my computer let, would let me open the document. <laughs> I could do something here. Okay. Um, yeah, so the first group says challenges to improve tooling. So that was really, you know, what I had this on this one slide, a couple of questions from Yari and, and Paul, but, um, you know, also, you know, what are the challenges with the current toolings that we have? Um, so this is optional, you know, if people want to talk about it, they can. Um, I've seen that already a lot of people signed up to the um, diversity and inclusivity group. Um, so I hope that is that these topics are clear. There were like a slide with a lot of questions there. 
and I was pretty much expecting to have a large group here, similar for the affiliation group. That looks also pretty good. Um, yeah, questions about challenges for content analysis. This is also probably more a little bit about tooling, like how can you actually apply um, the given um, methodologies to um, to email content and RFCs content. Um, this was the slide about you know things like keyword detection, um, natural language processing applied, and so on. So from position papers, I understood there were a lot of open challenges still. Um, then group number five, this is the decision making very much matching to um, what we discussed at the previous session on uh, at the beginning, like how how um, are decisions made? How do how, what's the process to get to an RFC and what are the success, success first factors for that? Um, there's group number six on sustainability and climate change. Uh, this is also the two papers I just mentioned uh, about the questions, how the meeting and how our technology impact climate change. Um, and then there's the, the group number seven on uh, online meeting and productivity. That was like my <laughs> question I had. How did how did participation change with the move to fully online, and how does it impact productivity? How does it impact impact new work? How does it impact diversity? Are more people participating in these kind of things? And then um, there was group number eight, or there is group number eight which is um, on impact and implementation. So that's also something we discussed in the earlier sessions about like, how can we measure if the products we have in the IETF the RFCs are actually successful, are actually implemented and used. And as I said, people can also add more topics here. But it seems like everybody is uh, kind of more or less signed up already. And I see that people sign up for more than one group. Um, you can do that if you have time for that the next uh, couple of days. It probably makes um, things a little bit more complicated, but sure. I mean, I don't think this is a problem. Everybody's just staring at the document. We can also talk. Well, I think, <laughs> well, I, I think the document is uh, populating quite nicely. I mean, there are uh, there are a significant amount of people in the uh, in the different groups. Some are actually also getting quite large. So, um, uh, I some people have not uh, uh, signed up on Slack. So, uh, if you are not on Slack, it might be a good idea to do that so that the groups can convene there and organize them there uh, themselves. If people would be uh, willing to have a bit of a coordinating role, they could make their names bold under the group so as to ensure that uh, uh, that people meet in the same place and can coordinate and that we have slides by uh, by Thursday. So if people would be so generous to uh, to volunteer for that, that would be uh, uh, very much appreciated. So I see Sebastian is uh, is doing that for the affiliation and industry control. That's really excellent. Glad to bold other people's names. <laughs> you would, would you like me to make you bold, Wes? Is that? Uh... No, that's not what I was asking. So maybe Sebastian, uh, um, I... if you've now taken the lead, maybe you can explain qu quickly what you would like to discuss in that session, so other everybody's in the same boat there. On that group, I guess. Well, we seem to have a uh, a lively conversation about. Um, it would be good to have some kind of standardized methods or thinking about how to do affiliation organizations with all these different data sets. Um, I don't. I uh, you know don't have a strong view about where that should go, but it seems like something I'd be happy to facilitate. Uh, that. The, the main thing we're we're missing is uh, Justice Barron, uh, who's not yet on the Slack. So uh, Justice, I guess I'll reach you out to you by email if we come to a decision about how to where the rooms are. Yeah, I've I've been trying to join the Slack for a couple of times. I'm I'm sorry, I, I'm I'm new to that. I. It's cool. I'll uh, I'll just make sure to keep you in the loop. Okay. Thanks.
yeah, if anybody still has problems um, to join Slack, you can also just send me an email and I can send you an individual invite. So maybe that's easier. Um, yeah. No, Otherwise, um, if you are, if you're not in Slack and you are happy to put your email address in the Google Doc, that might also be the easiest way to provide this information. Okay, um, so we have a whole uh, bunch of people also in the diversity group. And did Wes volunteer now to lead this group or not? I did not. Um, it would be better if somebody else could just because I'm <clears throat> rather swamped with the multiple deadlines this week. But uh, I will be participating and uh, uh, looking into certain things that I'm interested in, certainly. Uh, thank you for whoever's putting in the list of projects. That was, it's a good idea for, um, I think Yari's doing that. Yari, do you want to lead this group? I, I, I see that you say you're not available tomorrow, but we could still probably organize mm. the group a little bit. No, I can't, I can't really, sorry. Okay. As you may know, okay, then uh, we... some dates of things, some dates of things. So then we ask Stephen. Yeah. Yeah. Stephen? Yep, sure. I'll try that. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I guess uh, there are already some key points. Um, so I guess more people can just add more. <laughs> um then let's actually jump to group number five because that's also rather a big group. Um, anybody interested in leading that group? I guess Niels is proposing Karsten. Uh, I can see that that's probably not going to work so very well. You said it's not going to work very well? Not going to work very well, no. Okay, Michael? Yeah, I see myself being marked by somebody. <laughs> yeah, I can do that. I can take a okay. lead and get people together and so forth. I mean, at least you read all the papers, so. Yeah. Um, yeah, we have also, uh, I, I think, a good number of people in the group number six um on sustainability um i would also be very interested to see some results there and i guess niels is proposing stuff stuff cool uh, such a bad idea because i'm <laughs> not an expert here somebody who knows about it well. somebody who knows about it well. and the best thing is that the, the the leadership has no uh no issue expertise that's uh that those make the best leaders to nominate right. Daniel. Daniel. I could, uh, yeah. All right, I, I could take it. Okay, perfect. Okay. Um, and then we still have, I guess, group number four with two people. Um, Priyanka. You signed up for this one? Yeah, I was just thinking about something because I, uh, as, I, as you can see, I, I am doing something uh, that are planned for the group two. So just wondering what exactly could be a possible project. I was thinking of uh, seeing, uh, I think, a uh, question that whether large language models can do uh, text mining NLP on the content that is there. That was the question some people had. Maybe just test whether that that is happens. You know, by um, seeing if I can get sentiments and opinions. Just thinking. Yeah, there's only one other person, um, Effie, who signed up. So um, is that the same group of interest? Doesn't make sense to to um, meet the just the two of you and have some discussions. 
I'm okay. I already have something uh, that I'd like to do in group two, so I'm I'm okay. Okay. So you're saying you don't want to have the we don't need group four potentially. So, I mean, we ended up with quite large groups now. We could also try to split up work a little bit more if that is possible in any way. Especially group number three um, is quite large. So, is there any way to like split this up into two topics? Yeah, if I can just hop in. Um, maybe we can. Uh... So leave the larger group for what it is. And they sell is they figure out that they need to fit into more groups because I'm sure that when the discussion hits that they figure out like these are the different issues that we want to focus on instead of us trying to do that before we know what the what the questions are the group is interested in. Sure, I mean this is possible as well. I'm just just trying because we only have we only have two days, right? So I was trying, if we if we know already that there is a certain split, if we know already people have different interests, uh, it might be more efficient to do it up front, but not sure if that is the case. Yeah. I mean, so some of the content analysis stuff may tie into decision-making, uh, you know, in, in an understanding when, when the decision is being made from the email. So maybe we can combine that, that, that group, those two groups. Yeah, but are there, are there bigger groups? Are they one project or multiple? Oh, it's a discussion group. It's a discussion. Group. Well, three is definitely multiple projects. So I guess it will now depend on how the groups among themselves uh, meet up in Slack or over email and start coordinating where they will have a meeting. Either um, I propose everyone uh, tries to meet online after this or tomorrow uh, uh, at the start of the program to coordinate and uh, 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 and devise labor and projects and try to bring everyone along. I mean, we do have, uh, we would have 50 more minutes right now. So if people in that group want to speak up or write down what they're planning to do, uh, we could use the, the next 50 minutes for that. Sebastian, do you want to take a lead on that? It's a uh, it's tall order. Um, I suppose what I what I my instinct would be to say, um, what are the data sources that we have which give us information about affiliations and organizations? Um, take stock of that. See if there's external data sets that we're interested in. Um, see what sorts of entity resolution tools we have that make use of those data sets and where there is room for improvement that would be high value. Um, that's what I would propose as sort of an activity for the group, but um, I certainly wouldn't strong arm anyone into that. So, yeah, if I remember um, the discussion earlier today correctly, then I think there were at least two sub questions. One was like looking at trends, um, how people change affiliation, you know, is there a trend from people work, moving to one company to other and, you know, maybe even there are specific events when these changes happening. So that was one question. And the other question was what Mallory, I think, brought up was about um, uh, stakeholder groups, right? How to actually assign these affiliations to or people to a stakeholder group and how does a stakeholder group act or is represented? So maybe that's a split we could um, consider. Good point. I will make a note of that in our Slack channel, which we have. If you would like to join this group, join uh, hashtag uh, IAB dash IAD dash affiliation. So I'll make a mention of those issues in the Slack. So there were also these questions pertaining to these indirect affiliations, like these consultants working 
who have like a direct affiliation, which might not be particularly informative, but they actually are controlled by this indirect affiliation or same goes for uh, academics who might work on a research project funded by industry or these kind of things, which are more challenging probably to measure than the actual employer, but just as relevant. So, um, it seems like some kind of data structure for the sort of topology of organizations and their properties is in order. Something which says, so uh, these are organizations that are of some kind of stakeholder group. These are multiple ways people can be affiliated. And that seems like a pretty broad design question. I, I guess uh, my, the reason why I was thinking about data sets is that um, doing, arguably doing that modeling well is sort of prior to a good empirical analysis, although lots of people have done empirical analysis with something more rough, um, sort of sort of more research question oriented and then sort of letting the noise be what it is. Uh, It seems like the discussion in the um, uh, in the Slack channel is taking off for that. So thanks so much for taking the lead on that, uh, Sebastian. Do other groups also have um, their Slack channels going, or would they prefer other means of communication? So Stephen, uh, Michael, and Safikul, could you uh, either set up a, a, a Slack channel and add the people in your group or uh, uh, agree with your group on another uh, mode of communication such as? Already happening. Awesome. So we have uh, climb, IAB, IAD, climate change for group six. We have for group five, um, Something that Colin has created, IBAID process. Decision making. As, no, decision making was the one that I made that you should leave, I uh, can't delete it anymore because Colin has one, made one in parallel. So it's IBAID process. Okay. Because Colin, I think indeed he was faster. At least he was faster announcing, if not even making, we did it in parallel. Yeah, that's that. Excellent. So uh, I think that means that every group now has its own Slack channel. From the email, the WebEx and the Gather Town for tomorrow are clear. So uh, I propose that people meet tomorrow at uh, 2 UTC or later today in the Slack channel to uh, get the hackathon working. Yeah, if um, there are no further questions, we can just move on to the next part. Um, I also, I, I guess Corinne will mention this uh, as well, but I also want to mention that we do, with, that we can use the Gather Town. The ITF Gather Town um, is open and running as always. Um, you can all just join and connect there. I might just hang out there a little bit more after the meeting if people have questions. Um, and it's there 24 hours, so free for you to join there. And yeah, who, who's doing the closing session? Uh, who's doing the closing session? Uh, yeah, it's okay. Then I hand it over to yeah, you, Corinne. Then I hand it over to you, Corinne. Niels is a uh, kind of uh, Malin told me, but it's um, because it's always such a hard, hard job, but I'll try and give it a go. So thanks so much, everyone, for being here. Um, the participants, the program committee, as well as Kate for taking notes. 
Um, I do think we had a really exciting and pretty fast paced day. Um, we did a lot of things moving from the tools and the data to the methods to how to use these for a variety of questions, including um, industry control, who the community is, and how the process by which decisions get made actually happen. Um, and I think, you know, over the last couple of hours, we've gone really granular. And that sometimes almost makes us forget what is at stake, um, namely improving our understanding of how standards protocols are made, which, you know, obviously directly influences how the internet works, um, and also to a certain extent what the future of the internet looks like. Um, and I do think what we've seen today is that there's a whole, a whole lot of, of things that we don't know about how the sausage of internet standards get made. Um, and I do think that some of the most burning questions, um, you know, that have been articulated by people today uh, can actually maybe be answered this week. Um, I do think we have a really unique opportunity here for us to work together and make real headway in answering, for example, you know, how wearing different hats can influence standard outcomes or how diversity plays into ongoing discussions or what questions that we have or raise cannot be answered by data but need a different kind of approach. Um, and also what success looks like for the IETF's process. Um, and so I wanna end the day today by evoking Niels' presentation. Um, he quoted Jay's surprise by the lack of use of data. Um, and I think that if we showed anything today, it's that there are many smart folks using the IETF's data, but there's a real need for those communities to be folded into the IETF or at least for us to create bridges between the important research, uh, the support research work and the IETF's day-to-day -day work. Um, and I think that doing so isn't just important for the IETF itself, but also for the different communities that participate within it, uh, including as some had mentioned, civil society organizations or smaller companies or operators um, or others who are a little bit further removed from the work. Um, but also because we need to, consider the global communities that rely on IETF standards. So with that call to arms, um, I would like to close off our first day of the Show Me the Numbers workshop on analyzing IETF data. Um, I really, again, would encourage everyone to participate in the hackathon, to get organized, um, and I, for one, at least look forward to the hackathon days and seeing the results from uh, from the new collaborations that I, that I hope will develop this week uh, and seeing all of you again on Thursday. So thank you again so much. And if there's anything I have forgotten, please feel free to hop in. And if not, see you tomorrow, Wednesday and Thursday. Yeah, thank you everybody. Again, maybe see you together, but see you later the next day.